Okay, we're going to begin this meeting of the Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities. Madam Secretary, please call the roll.
Okay, we've uh, established a quorum. I'm going to go over what we're going to do today because of the late start. We're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, we're going to go into executive session and at least knock out a couple of bills quickly in executive session, possibly all four. And then we have a witness for House Bill 1849 that needs to get back to St. Louis. So when we go into the bill hearings, we're going to start with uh, 1849. And then uh, we will go to uh, 1898, and then we'll go to 1848. So with that, we're going to begin with House Bill 1835. We'll now go into an executive session on House Bill 1835. All right. Um, I don't believe we have a sub for. House Bill 1835, so I move that House Bill 1835 be voted to pass any discussion. Um, you got a good, uh, summary of what, uh, 1835 is the, the bill that deals with um, blind pension, Missouri. Currently, um, you're entitled to the blind pension. You have to get your access to get tested every five years. All my bill does is is say basically if you've lost all physical vision, you're not going to get it back. You don't have to do the testing every five years. You have to pay for it and say that it's required. Good, easy, Bill. And you're going to, are you going to go, you want consent on I would like it to be consent. Okay. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor, uh, say aye. Aye. All right, and we do need to roll call as well, so we'll roll call. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chair Clark? Aye. Vice Chair Clark? Aye. Aye. Representative Monticello? Aye. Aye. Present? Aye. Jannon? Aye. 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 Aye
by your vote of uh, 10 to 1, you have voted House Bill 17 be voted to pass. All right, let's now move to House Bill 1806, Representative Torpy's bill. I now move that House Bill 1806 be voted to pass discussion. Representative Torpy here, if not, we'll look at that for the video here. Um, this, this deals with uh, uh, conforming uh, the, the child care provider requirements with federal breaks. And it just basically gets us in line with the federal system. There's really no controversy to it. it it's not like uh, it's not like a quality rated system. It's just basically putting us in conformity with rigs that are coming down this year from the feds. And if we don't do this, we're not going to be in compliance, and we would put nine figures of child care block grants in, in jeopardy. So, <laughs> yep. For discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chair Chris Moore? Aye. Vice Chair Moore? Aye. Representatives <coughs> Monticello? Aye. Bratton? Aye. Gannon? Aye. Hart? Aye. Koenig? Meredith? Aye. Neely? Aye. Newman? Aye. Friendly? Aye. Sure. By your vote of 11 to 0, you have voted. House Bill 1806 be voted due pass. Okay, we have one more bill we're going to do, but we're going to defer that to the end. We need to get to some areas we will exec on House Bill 1813, but it's a little more involved with an amendment. And uh, we're going to go on and begin the hearing now on House Bill. 1849. Representative Conway, whenever you're ready. And if Representative Ellinger's here, if uh, you'd like to join her, that'd be fine. Thank you. Whatever you prefer. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to bring this very important bill to your attention today. As you can see, this is a very bipartisan bill. My uh, good friend and representative, uh, Ellinger has worked diligently for at least two years that I know of on this bill, and he was kind enough to include me in it. The thing I want to make clear from the very beginning is that no authority is being taken away from children and family services. We're not changing any of the laws or regulations that deal with child neglect and abuse. This is just giving away for people who have been put on the list for various reasons that are not um, that are that are minimal at best, gives them the opportunity to redeem themselves, to get off this list and move on with their lives. It divides up into three tiers, with the first tier being the most serious, of which there's no possibility at all of ever being taken off of the list. Tier two is lesser charges. That is, you're you're on for ten years. After the 10 years, you can petition, but if you commit any other acts in between or during that 10 years, no matter how small, uh, it's another 10 years from the date of that offense. The third tier uh, is the least uh, grievous of offenses, and in that is it five years or two years, Representative Ellinger? It's five years before you can petition. And if you have more than uh, two offenses, you automatically move to tier one. So, with that, I will give uh, Representative Ellinger a chance to make a statement. Oh, thank you. And thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman, for allowing us to testify at this matter today. The first thing I want to mention, there could be no question that if a child has been sexually abused in any way, he remains on Tier 1. That means he can never come off. But we're not going to get into what's the less lesser section of it. But the division of children draws up the rules as to what they consider a, a moderate offense, maybe a slap with a belt, or uh, a more serious offense, such a punch, that matter. Uh, this allows, though, those people 
uh, to have a better procedure in getting before this court to uh, prove their innocence or to show their guilt. Uh, we were given figures by the division that indicate uh, there are over 11 million people on this list. Now, the only way that could be possibly true, because there's only 7 million Zerns, is that even when you die, your name stays on this list. And we do have a witness that will talk of a couple of examples of uh, lawyers who deal with these people. Um, this gives an appeal. Uh, actually, it is two years after the final denial. If you have had no mi and just minor offenses, you can come on. Another real advance of this bill is that there's going to be certified letters sent uh, to the accused. Right now, many say they never get it, and that's probably true. The poor move a lot. Those of us who have worked at legal services tell you that. So they never get a notice, they never get a hearing, and they never get a job. Because there are the kind of people sometimes that get snared in this, have to do the most menial kind of work with children, uh, with the elderly, in hospitals, and so on, and they are excluded with no chance to correct. That seems fundamentally un-American to me. It flies against what we lawyers call due process, your ability to come before a court and to adjudicate. And so I will stop there and call it. Representative, is your first witness a uh, witness that needs to get back to St. Louis? Yes, she's here. Very good. Let's have her first. Thank you. Those who wish to testify in favor of the bill. I want to remind witnesses, please complete your witness form and leave the force. Thank you. Thank you to the committee for allowing me to appear today. Um, my name is Kathleen Dubois, and I'm the managing attorney of uh, what is called the Family Court Project. It's part of Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. We've been working as lawyers on child abuse and neglect cases for 15 years now in St. Louis County. Um, the first time that this problem um, of, of whether or not people could have some recourse once they've rehabilitated themselves to take themselves off the registry. Uh, the first time that came to my attention was when Commissioner Reese um, in St. Louis County asked my office to help a nurse who had um, had a, a problem with who had been placed on the registry because of abuse or neglect of a child um, and had, had then rehabilitated herself had proved to the court that she rehabilitated herself and had gotten her children placed back with her. The court was ready to terminate jurisdiction and, and at that point she was not able to work in her, her chosen job as a nurse. So um, it was the judge himself, Commissioner Weesey, who was asking us to try to find out what she could do in order to put herself in a position where she could now support her family again. Um, that was when I started looking into to Missouri's um, legislation having to do with the hotline and the registry. Um, Missouri is, um, this, this bill that's before you now, House Bill 1849, really brings Missouri into line with the majority of other states. Most of the other states, I believe it's 46 states, um, have set up a tier system where the um, level of abuse is recognized and, and according to a definition that has to do with the harm to the child, the severity of the harm, and then allows people to demonstrate that they have rehabilitated themselves, which is something that they also have to do through the family court in order to have children return to them. And um, if that person can demonstrate that they've rehabilitated themselves, that they take accountability for their actions, then in other states they are removed from the registry. Um, that at this point is not possible. And in fact, the, the notice of appeal that's sent to, to um, persons who are accused says this is a lifetime um, registry. The Missouri Supreme Court has called this a stigma that um, actually affects people's ability to work. So that was the concern that brought this, this um, legislation up. Um, 
I have represented a number of different people whose ability to work was directly affected by um, their, their placement on the registry. And these are people, some of whom never appealed because they didn't know about the, the placement on the registry. Some of them did not have a lawyer, so they were not able to appeal or they weren't able to present an appropriate case to show that they had not done what they were alleged to have done. Uh, some of them are people who are just so much in crisis that they ignore what notifications they receive. Um, many of them are people who were placed on the registry long, long ago. Um, in one of my cases, a grandmother who had been placed on the registry 16 years before was trying to get custody of her grandchildren who had been abused by the mother's boyfriend. Um, she had totally rehabilitated herself and was completely approved by the court and by Children's Division as far as taking custody of those grandchildren. Um, she was close to the mother, was going to be able to provide transportation to visits and to basically support these children in maintaining their bond with their mother. Um, she was forced to um, let her children go into foster care because she was not able to do anything to have herself taken off the registry. And the incident that had placed her on the registry 16 years ago involved her, her daughter being sent to her room and the daughter called the children's division at that point and complained that she was being locked in the house. So that sort of situation comes up over and over again. Um, and, and the length of time that that grandmother remained on the registry is exactly what this bill um, confronts. Um, so um, other situations that should be of concern to the committee have to do with domestic situations where one party in a domestic situation will call the hotline on the adversary party hoping to get a, to, to get a, um, some leverage in the custody battle over the children. Um, and Children's Division deals with these issues night and day. Um, they are not there to, to you know, find out who is telling the truth and who is not in a divorce situation. But they find themselves having to investigate those nonetheless because they have to respond to the calls that they receive. So many times it, it has to do with things that, that you know, that, that are not motivated by someone being a child abuser but have to do with ex-spouses or neighbors who are calling on one another for <laughs> some sort of a, a, um, an argument or disagreement. Um, there are many people who, who um, are poor who are affected by this, uh, particularly because people who are, are well-to-do tend to be able to solve their own problems, whereas poor people generally don't have the sort of support in the community that others have in order to, to be able to, to solve their children's problems. Um, another client that I had, um, her utilities had been turned off in her home. Um, she had actually rented a house without knowing that the house had been, um, been declared to be uninhabitable by the county. And um, the landlord would not correct the utilities in the home. The electric was off. She had placed her children with a friend and the children would come and see her after school and she would feed them meals. One of the children told the school officials that there was no food in her house because, and, and in fact, the mother had been feeding them out of a picnic cooler. Um, the school called the hotline. Uh, those children, and there were five of them, were taken into foster care. And uh, they were placed with a non-relative friend of the family, but they remained in foster care for a long, long time. And they were terrified and very tearful every time they came into court that that mother could not get them back. Um, and that was that was one of the cases that, that I ended up taking up to the Child Abuse and Neglect Review Board. So um, neighbors testified that she had had the children fed, that she was sending the children home with, with another person, that they weren't living in the house. So um, these are the sort of situations that we see every day. Um, what you're seeing here in this bill is, is really just allowing Children's Division to do what they do very well already, which is to d determine what level of harm a child was exposed to, to 
follow with the family court, the rehabilitation of a person. Um, that children's division record is going to include a basically a checklist for what that parent has to do to rehabilitate himself or herself. So those, those conditions are already going to be available for children's division once that person at petitions to be removed from the Child Abuse and Neglect Review Board. So this is not something that children's division will have to put new procedures into place necessarily. Um, they've been given additional time to July 1st of 2015 in order to establish regulations and do what needs to be done to establish the protocols, the legal protocols for, for removal. So, um, in fact, this should be something that, that will be dealt with in, in large part through the regulations that Children's Division adopts. Um, I have no other comments at this time, but if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Uh, questions of the witness, Representative Monticello. Okay. Fire, please. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine. How are you? I have several questions um, for you. Have are you aware of any circumstances where the department has found that children can go back into a home? In other words, they've been rehabilitated, as you say, and they go back in home and they're subsequent abuse later. The only situations like that that I've seen involved something other than physical abuse. For example. Um, a child who was left home alone and when the child was returned home to the mother, someone else in the family abused the child. Well, I can tell you, I can give you multiple instances where it has happened. Can you, do you have any situations where um, grandparents were abusers and continue to abuse? Um, I can't think of any where grandparents were abusers and continue to abuse. I do know situations where um, non-relative foster parents did abuse. Well, I, I can again give you multiple circumstances. One of the most serious cases of abuse that I experienced as an educator was a grandparent and who actually was able to remove custody from the biological parents, was put back into her custody, and it was one of the most serious cases of abuse, of mental and physical abuse that I witnessed in my, in my 20, 25 plus years of teaching. Have you, uh, are you aware of any circumstances where perhaps the non-abusive parent, if, as you um, indicated, um, the department is, comes in and perhaps it's a boyfriend or husband or someone else is abused and while that um, other parent is not the physical abuser, that she continues to go back to those relationships and the abuse is able to continue just by nature if those children are still in those homes. I, 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 I believe that the tier yeah, two. Can you answer that, please? Um, I, I do believe I, that. I've had a case that they had, and it, one of my constituents, a child died. Died. So I'm hesitant to um, move in a direction that's going to take out of the department's hands the ability to keep these records on hand so they can kill, keep children safe. Um, the other thing is we talked about, you mentioned that, well, I mean, I'll go to the handlers because this is more to the bill itself, um, but I, I can give you multiple circumstances where the abuse has continued to happen and we are, our number one priority should be making sure that children are safe. And these are cases where they have been substantiated. These aren't just calls that have come in and somebody's made an allegation. I also know how difficult it is at times for the department to substantiate and address these um, situations of abuse. So we're not talking about, you know, somebody just calls and they think something happened. These are substantiated cases of abuse where the department has intervened. So thank you for your testimony. If I, if I may, just a minute, please. Please know that this doesn't change any of those laws. This doesn't change the ability to put people on that record and keep them there forever. And even if they are removed, that's just for public consumption. Those records would still be available to anyone who needs to have them. Well, it's my understanding, talking to the department, they're concerned that they may not have access to those records. And again, even if it's, even if it's just for the department, I don't want those people teaching my children. I don't want those people 
uh, I don't want to put other people's children at risk. So that would be my concern. And I, I am really concerned with this bill. And there's also provision while you're up here, Representative, that you say that the Tier 1 could never come off. And correct me, Nate, maybe it's just a technicality here, but when I'm looking at page 13, it says individuals placed on line 123. Hard to follow on page 13. It says individuals placed on the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry after July 1, 2015. <coughs> May petition the Children's Division for review and record removal of all identifying information. So it doesn't say anything about that. that doesn't apply to Tier 1. I believe, Representative, it's referred back earlier when Tier 1 is described. Okay, so we are clear because I know the department had some concerns that there were provisions that the Tier 1 um, would be able to petition as well to come off of the, the registry. Are we sure that that's not the case? Okay. Well, we, we in no way want to encumber the department from doing what they need to do. Okay, thank you. Further questions, Alexis? Representative Neely. For inquiry, please. Uh, I think I heard you uh, say this, but I, I want some further clarity. You said that, that there's a uh, maybe a custody situation going on uh, with two parties that uh, sometimes uh, the DFS uh, sees that. And are you saying that maybe there's not a great amount of uh, investigation going on, that uh, sometimes it's just good lawyering uh, in regards to a complaint, uh, that that's in, uh, one party is going after the other party and they're using the abuse as, a, as an excuse? The only one like specifically like that, that, that I remember exactly what the division said, um, basically stated, we can't tell what the situation is, so we're removing the children from both parents. Okay. Thank you. I think this is an important dialogue that we continue. Representative Meredith. Motion to inquire. When, who keeps this registry? Where is it? Um, this is an automated registry that Children's Division keeps. Um, where it, the information is entered, I'm not exactly sure, but it is available for um, employers or potential employers and others such as the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts who may call with concerns about whether or not someone is safe. Or so it's, it's not like CaseNet that a lot of people know about and they just go to CaseNet. This seems like it's more, I mean, I work with courts and I really like Commissioner Weesey, by the way. Um, and I've never heard of this registry, and I work with abused children. Um, I also know that the division is very, very careful. They're, they don't want to remove a child until they, you know, unless they really have to, which is understandable. You have to make sure it's really happening uh, before you share a family apart. But to get those families back together again is not an easy task. It does not happen in weeks. It does not happen in months. Years. And I know that um, having dealt with uh, drug abusers who were parents um, and then discovering what was really going on in the background, it was very, very difficult to convince the court that this one parent would be just fine, that this parent did everything they needed to do. And it wasn't easy. And the child was out of the home uh, at least two years while all this is going on. So they, they don't take it by them. But I'm wondering if I was going to hire somebody if it never would occur to me to look for a child abuse registry until I saw this. This, this is the, the sort of thing that is maintained by the state, similar to the sex offender registry, which although, although that is something you can check online, but um, there are some other registries that have to do with folks who are caring for elders and so forth. So there, there are a number of different registries. Um, and, and actually, the, the source that probably would, would give you the most information about this registry is the Supreme Court case, Jamison versus Department of Social Services, in which a lady who was the executive director of an agency that was an adoption foster care agency was hotline. And this is the case that found that the, the standard of proof in front of the children's division was not to be um, was not to be probable cause, but was to be um, 
preponderance of evidence that due process applies to these sorts of, of um, investigations. So um, that would probably be one place to, to start with in order to look into what this registry is all about. Should we also let it be known to employers that this registry exists somehow? I mean, I certainly think we're that that's for others. It, it seems like we need to have some way to let people know. That's totally appropriate. Uh, you know, I, I really feel as though um, one of the things that, that the, the populace don't realize is that um, there are different ways of getting information about people. And perhaps we should be checking ourselves as well to find out whether or not some soccer coach called on us or something like that. Thank you. For the question, Representative Newman. To inquire, Mr. Chair. Uh, Kathleen, thank you so much for being down here. I know it's a trek from St. Louis, and a, your uh, real world experience is valuable, I believe, you know, for the committee to actually decide, you know, in terms of what needs to be done. Because without your experience, and, you know, without your real cases, we don't have a concept. And so I just wanted to thank you again for, for being in front of us and, and being willing to testify. Thank you, Representative. Questions? Seeing none, any others wish to testify in favor of House Bill 1849, and thank you for coming. Mr. Chairman, committee, for the record, Kerry Messer on behalf of Missouri Family Network. Uh, I want to testify today based on some personal experience. I'm not representing uh, the board that I serve on, but I do serve on one of the Child Abuse and Neglect Review Boards. So there's uh, five or six such boards that meet each month, uh, sit there all day hearing cases, uh, and these are the cases where a person who's been substantiated has appealed, uh, they've asked for an administrative appeal. This is not criminal law, this is civil law. These are individuals who are substantiated, uh, I believe most of the time very rightly so, Children's Division is overwhelmed. They've got an enormous task in front of them in every county of the state. And then those people who are substantiated have the option of requesting an administrative repeal, uh, appeal, which ends up now putting them before our board is the last thing that occurs. The board makes one final decision. They either uphold or reverse the Children's Division's substantiation. When that's done, it's done. They, they may end up in criminal court or they may sue privately uh, in civil court if they wish to, but the, the harsh reality is this board has to sit and listen to uh, a presentation from the Children's Division and from the substantiated individual's uh, perspective, approximately 20 minutes each side, and then that board uh, spends time uh, in private discussing the case that they are looking at. We have paperwork on the case and have to make a decision. One way or the other, and that's it. And none of these are cases that are going before a criminal court, because if they were, we're not allowed to even hear, hear the review on them. Uh, but here's what happens. We hear these cases, and too often, it's hard to say, you know, do I say most of the time, much of the time, there will be several cases each time we sit down where the case before us there is nothing more than a he said she said situation there is nothing more than uh and this is these are the cases that we really hate the person is clearly guilty of violating the letter of the law but they are the scapegoat for some institution where the policies of the institution left this adult in charge of too many children, or left them in a situation where to, to stop something bad from happening had to turn their back on someone else who there was not adequate adult supervision for. And the turning the back on, on another child is what got them substantiated because they clearly uh, violated the letter of the law. Now you've got a board sitting here who has to decide do we uphold or do we reverse the decision of the children's division. One of the key things that I see coming up all the time is, what is this person's employment? What is their education track? 
for their future employment. And when we get, we're in one of those tough situations, there's a lot of people who have these substantiations reversed only because they're going to lose their job or they've already lost their job, they can't get it back unless it's reversed. The board has, there's nothing, it's just clear black and white at the end of the day, you make a decision and it's final. We believe that, I believe, excuse me, I believe if we had a tiered system, it would bring uh, the ability to stick with the facts and, and deal with the, the harsh realities a little better because you know this isn't something, you know, on the minor, if I could phrase it this way, I want to be careful <laughs> saying it this way, but I hope you understand me when I say the minor uh, offenses, that there's some light at the end of the tunnel, that if the board made, made a mistake, if the chosen division was just stuck, that they have to deal with the letter of the law, that this individual or this individual's family is not left uh, dangling off a cliff for the rest of their lives. That's what I would throw out there, but I probably would serve you better if you had questions for me. But uh, I really believe that we would be better served if we had a tiered system to segregate the people that it was clearly a bad actor who was truly harming children versus the person who got caught up in, in the middle of some policy decision or policy perspective that left them in the lurch and they end up in trouble with the state. Thank you very much. Questions of witness, Representative Monticello. Fire. Um, did I hear you say that what's taken into account is their employment and their um, or could you go back and repeat that? You said their employment, and I thought you talked about their income. Not income. Not income. So no. I just heard you say income. No, but I, I hope you're not suggesting that only poor people abuse children. Absolutely not. Okay. Um, Do you want me to clarify that? Yeah, that's why I wanted to be sure that I understood you correctly. Um, in my years of experience, and I bring a lot of experience, I don't just sit in a law firm and have people bring cases to me that they want me to fix. My real life experience is actually dealing with real children and real children who have been abused. I cannot think of one situation where I felt the department intervened, removed children, substantiated cases erroneously, where I felt like they were being heavy handed. I can give you multiple circumstances for whatever reason. In some cases it was just because the department's hands were tied and they couldn't get the evidence they needed, but I can't give you one instance where I feel, felt that the department came in and they substantiated and they took action. Um, many, I'm sorry, but there are many cases where they didn't take action for whatever reason maybe they couldn't when kids were being abused. So on the one hand, my experience tells me that the department doesn't come in heavy handed. They don't move children willy-nilly. I, I can't think of one, but I do know of several circumstances where children have been left in dangerous situations for whatever reason, whether they couldn't do it or for whatever reason. So again, when I hear that case has been substantiated and the department has taken action, my experience tells me they've done so with very good cause. Now, the department may feel that it's appropriate, they want to keep families intact to put those children back with their family. That's their family doesn't give those individuals the right to go and interact and deal with other people's children because if I understand correctly, we're talking about them getting jobs that would um, would cause them or bring them to work with children. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. So I again, if the department substantiated these cases, then they probably not, not to be working with children. Well, the law does allow that person who's been substantiated uh, some due process. The, the due process amounts to this. Uh, they appeal for an administrative review. That's in-house. That's the same people who substantiated in the first place, along with the independent board, the Child Abuse and Neglect Review Board. Uh, and again, this is not a court of law. There's no cross-examination. Literally 20 minutes for each side to, to present their case and then a decision is made by a panel of people uh, who were very handicapped in, in making some of that decision. That, and from there, if they have the money, they can go to civil court. Let, let me clarify. But you're kind of making my, excuse me, I don't mean to cut you off, but you're kind of making my point. They've had their due process. 
They're on the list. They have their due process. It, it is. And they're on the list. They've, they've, had, they've had charges substantiated. There's been action taken by the department. They've had their due process and they've gone on the list. Except there's people no longer on that list because the board has reversed the children's division because they're looking and all they can see is two divorced parents fighting each other or he said, she said. In some cases are reversed because the person accused, there's no investigation. There were other adults that could, that were in the situation that could have been the abuser and they were never questioned. They were never, we don't know if this is the right person or not. These are very difficult decisions. All I'm saying is by having a multi-tiered system, it brings a little more humanity, if I could say, to the board's decisions on how to move forward, how to determine, you know, do we just totally reverse and that's the end of it. They're off the list, they're, they're going free, and what, what the children's would, division has lost everything. What would, you have, what would you have me tell the grandmother that I spoke with numerous times over the summer whose grandson died mm -hmm. and the abuse was brought to the attention of the department multiple times, some of them minor, you know, initially, you know, this or that. Mother continued to go back to the boyfriend. What would you have me say to her? And, and when the, after her grandson died, she was frantic and worried this summer that because the da her daughter supposedly had rehabilitated herself but was back with the boyfriend, she was concerned that those children were going to go back into their custody. What would you have me say to her? And she's already lost a grandson. She knows her daughter was still using drugs. She knows that the, the boyfriend is still abusive. What would you have me say to her? Because she's not real interested in hearing about tearing, and she wants to make sure that her other grandchildren are safe. You're and she wants to make sure that other children are safe. Okay. You're talking about cases that are going to be in that top tier. Uh, how the tears are top but, to bottom. But initially bottom, those top. cases would cases not have been. Top. But initially those first charges wouldn't have been. They were re rehabilitated. He was rehabilitated. Those children are safe to go back into what? the home. They went back into the home. Right. The cases continue. Under under this tier system, this individual could have been removed from the list. No, well, that would be ten years as this bill is written. Uh, but what I would also what I'm trying to tell you, or what I'm trying to communicate to you. Because there's a lot of people who are coming off of the substantiated list at the review board process because the board will, the board sees that the punishment is too harsh in a situation that's too nebulous. Well, it's not got, they don't they don't have cross examination. You don't have uh, attorneys for majority of these cases, and the board is trying to be humane and trying to do the right thing, but they're also looking at you know, what was the reason, what's the preponderance of evidence here? And, you know, those, those early citations that you're referring to, uh, to try to catch those bad actors early on, those are falling through the cracks. And what I'm saying is, when we have to decide, do we put the hammer down now before there's enough evidence that shows that they're going to turn into a really bad actor, or do we assume that they're not going to become that one? really bad actor. That's not serving us well either. Well, it's, it's tier two is 10 years, tier three is five years. Um, that's going to be a little comfort to to my grandmother who, you know, five and years, maybe, she's got a five-year-old and, you know, when her, when her grandchildren are 10 years old or 15-year-olds are back or back in that situation. So again, a lot of times these cases start at tier three and then they can escalate. So thank, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate and share what you're, what we're both trying to communicate. I, we need to do something because right now we've got too many bad actors. You're right. We need to do something. We it. need to tighten our child abuse laws and we need to protect children. You're right. We absolutely need to do something and that should be our focus rather than um, trying to protect um, the abusers. Thank you. Are there questions of the witness? That was one of your more civil exchanges with Mr. Messer. I have to commend you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I do want to clarify. I'm not advocating that that uh, we go easy on bad actors. Uh, but I, I believe the committee understands my testimony. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll hear from you later today.
All right. Further questions, uh, further witnesses in favor of uh, House Bill 1849? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Joe Arkwith with Missouri Family Policy Council, here to support uh, Representative Ellinger and Representative Conway's uh, legislation. Mr. Chairman, uh, late uh, in the last session, uh, I was approached by Representative Ellinger about his intentions with regard to this bill. Uh, his interest in seeing that the Child Abuse and Neglect Registry draw some distinction between cases of serious physical and emotional abuse and uh, single instances of non-serious neglect. It was my privilege over the interim to have numerous conversations with him and his staff to be involved in discussion of a number of redrafts of this proposal. And he will be the first one to tell you that I uh, urge cautious uh, direction with regard to these changes that um, would ensure to the greatest degree possible that there would be no jeopardy to the health, safety, or welfare of children in this state. Conversations were held directly uh, with staff from the Children's Division, with the General Counsel of the Children's Division about these changes with the understanding that there was not going to be any change that would, really, would impair in any way the ability of state officials to have access to all of the information that has ever existed for them to continue to be able to do their job in the area of child welfare. And this proposal does not do that. It changes the accessibility of information on the child abuse and neglect registry to various parties, but does not expunge any information about anybody with regard to any investigation that has been conducted by Children's Division. The version of this legislation that I support is what I believe to be the latest version of substitute to come, uh, which calls for two tiers. That there would be uh, a bottom tier that would be individuals who were found uh, in cases of substantiation with regard to a single inst instance of child abuse and neglect and that all other parties would remain on the uh, registry permanently. <coughs> That's uh, the form of this legislation that I support. One of the issues that hasn't really been spoken to but I think is important for you to examine as you look over how this legislation should most properly read is unsubstantiated cases. Currently in the law, uh, it is possible for an unsubstantiated case to remain on the registry for five years. And that is another situation that is altered uh, under the terms of this bill. I know that members of the committee here have expressed concern about uh, the adequacy of the state's uh, resources to effectively investigate and uh, safeguard the welfare of children. Uh, I share those sentiments. When I was a member of the General Assembly, I shared those sentiments to the degree that I actually went on child abuse and neglect investigations with state officials and with child care workers uh, to actually see them happen with permission of the families, of course, but nonetheless saw it. I, too, do not want to see anything done that limits our parents back their ability to do their job. I don't believe this legislation does that. I have to answer questions. Questions of the witness? I can see none. Thank you for your testimony. Any other questions to testify in favor of the bill? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Woody Kozan. I'm a registered lobbyist. I'm here today on behalf of CNS Corporation, which is the sole funder of Heartland Community in Northeast Missouri, uh, to speak in support of the bill. We've always thought for some time that a tiered system of some sort needed to be there and that there ought to be a way for at least some people under extreme circumstances to be, have their names removed from the registry. Um, some years ago, a completely different bill was 
before this committee, <coughs> and a woman came in from St. Louis and quoted a study, which I later looked at, that had been done at St. Louis University. And uh, what professors had done was take a group of people who had been substantiated by the division uh, as having been guilty of child abuse and neglect and placed on the registry. And then they took another block of the same size, same number of people, people who'd been charged and were substantiated and were put on the registry. And they went down the road five years and saw what the recidivism rate was between the two groups. And it was exactly the same. Now that's very troubling because you would expect uh, if you took a group of ex-convicts who had been convicted of crimes, uh, five years later they'd have committed more crimes than a group of people who had been charged with crimes and found innocent. And if not, the natural conclusion is that you are convicting some people who aren't guilty and failing to convict some people who are guilty. And the result is that that the two groups will look exactly alike when it comes to whether they're a danger within five years down the road. They shouldn't look at all alike, but they did. And that, that was shocking, but it shouldn't have been too shocking, because back then, before the Jamison case, which has been described here today, and in which the lawyers representing Mrs. Jamison were ours, uh, before the Jamison case, there was no due process in this. And the standard to put your name on that registry was simply probable cause. That's enough to get a search warrant. And they would put your name on this list, you'd be ruined for life. Now that's never been accepted as a, an admissible standard in such cases by any court in this country, at least not by any federal court in this country. And, and so the Supreme Court of the State of Missouri said, no, it's got to be a preponderance of the evidence is the standard for whether your name goes on there. Secondly, you've got to have some due process, not the full panoply, and a sufficient amount of due process, as Mr. Messer said, is you, one social worker can't put your name on there anymore. You get to appeal it to the Child Abuse and Neglect Review Board. We also have a provision that you can then go to court de novo if you're not satisfied with that result. But that is taken advantage of by very few people, people who have the money to afford lawyers, because this isn't a contingency case, and you're going to have to pay the lawyer. Um, my client has had occasion to use that provision, and our success rate has been 100% in getting the courts to overturn what the Child Abuse and Neglect Review Board. It's not a very, thank heaven, a very large sample, but that's that's been our result. So uh, the system as it exists clearly errs in both directions. Sometimes we get somebody on this list who probably doesn't belong there. And sometimes we turn people loose who ought to be on this list. Uh, this system, however, assumes that they are found guilty after due process and their name's gone on the list. They've been substantiated. Their name's gone on the list. They've exhausted their due process. But they still get a chance to come back and say, okay, I look, I'm rehabilitated, and ask a court to take their name off this list. We don't think that's too much to ask. I do agree. I, I went back when representative raised the question about whether tier one people, the worst offenses, could get their names removed. And I think it's a little ambiguous, and I suspect that neither of the two representatives would argue if you put in after for the description of tier one, uh, people in this tier are ineligible for the process yes. described below. Well, the reason that we did that is that we don't anywhere want this to come close to anybody who's sexually offended a child. So I'm sorry, you may be completely innocent, but we're never going to get through this in the legislature if we set it up so that a, a, a sexual offender can get off. It strictly prohibits them from being reform in this. That's not good law, but that may be good policy here at Missouri. Well, I, I, I just would say I think Representative Marcello's point is correct. I'm not sure it's as clear as it needs to be in the way the statutes are drafted right now, that Tier 1 people are not eligible for this process. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't take a, a subclause of uh, a dozen words to make it absolutely clear that they're not eligible. I think we all agree that's the way it would be. So, but you go to act on this next week, uh, you 
you might want to consider doing that. Questions of the witness? Seeing none, thank you for testimony. Any others wish to testify in favor of the bill? Well, Representative Ellinger, we have to hand it to you. You have got a Republican sponsor and the three most conservative lobbyists in the building testifying in favor of this bill, and that's masterful bipartisanship. So we commend you. Uh, I appreciate that. With that, uh, are there any other questions to testify in opposition to the bill? My name is Emily Van Shankoff, and I'm the Deputy Director at Missouri Kids First. And I, um, there's a lot going through my head right now as I've heard all of this testimony. Um, I think that uh, I've really had some wonderful discussions with Representative Ellinger and Representative Conway, and they um, absolutely want to do the right thing for Missouri children and families, and I'm convinced of that. And I believe that uh, that uh, although we might differ in our perspective on child protection, that uh, that. Uh, that there is probably some, a lot of compromise to be had. So I did want to say that it's hard for me to hear a lot of this testimony because the stories that I hear are very different from the stories that were presented to you today. Um, for all of the stories that people have about um, people being falsely put on the uh, on the, the registry or this and that, I can tell you ten more stories of, of horrific cases of, of child abuse. And so all of those stories are what go through my head when I hear people saying, and people, you know, a daughter hotlined a mom and you know, or that these are custody battles. For me, that um, it becomes a little uncomfortable because that's not the reality of what our programs and centers see. And there are a lot of children in this state that are suffering. And um, and I, um, so I take all of this to very much to heart. Um, I actually think though that these cases aren't super relevant to the discussion of this bill because if we wanted to change some of the evidentiary standards, or we think there are a bunch of people being put on this that shouldn't be, there are different statutes that we would do this. This bill really tries to, to change a, a process that already exists for substantiating child abuse and, and then um, when, and then as Mr. Messer testified very, um, and was very illustrative in discussing how the CAM review board reviews, these are people that have had due process. And the way that this is drafted is that it's going forward, so from July 1st of 2015. So these are cases um, moving forward in the future that are already under our current standards of preponderance of the evidence. Um, uh, the principal concern that Missouri Kids First have with this bill um, is on page 9 and the three tiers. Um, and the, the tier 2 right now, such classification shall include multiple substantiation and multiple substantiated incidents of child abuse and neglect that are not classified as serious. So when we get to that point, we believe that that, you know, that is a pattern of behavior. And anyone who has been substantiated multiple times um, should not be able to petition to get off of, of the registry. Um, we can agree um, with the representatives that um, Tier 1 and Tier 3 would perhaps be right. And when Mr. Ortworth testified, he talked about a committee substitute. And for, forgive me if you all have one, and I, and I just am um, not aware of it. But we would be, um, if we could eliminate Tier 2, we would be comfortable with this bill. We do feel like there's probably some need to compromise and that a single substantiated case of child abuse that is not classified as serious is something that we could um, that we could probably agree would not uh, would not adversely affect children in Missouri too greatly. Um, makes me a little nervous, but I but I think we could give on that. I, what I'm extremely uncomfortable with is a pattern of behavior, someone who has multiple substantiations being able to get off the registry. Anyone who has done that does not need to be working with Missouri's vulnerable populations. Our vulnerable populations deserve much better than that. Um, we're not talking about them having their children removed. We're not talking about incarcerating them. We're saying that they can't work with vulnerable populations. And I do believe that the vulnerable populations, the children and the elderly in the state, deserve to not be working with caregivers who have had multiple substantiations. Um, and you know, from uh, you know, I hear a lot of talk about offenders and their need to get jobs. And you know, I hear that. Um, but at some point. I believe in accountability. I, I believe that if you um, have done something like this, you probably don't need to have you know, to be working with vulnerable populations. Perhaps you should get a job in another industry where you're not going to adversely affect people that um, have a limited ability to protect themselves. Um, again, we do hope that there can be some compromise crafted on this because I think we could probably live with tiers three and tier one. It's the tier two that just we're very uncomfortable with. Emily, in terms of tier two, and this may be a question for you and for Representative Ellinger Conway. Were there three tiers in last year's legislature? Um, and did you have a similar position last year? 
Um, last year, our position was we did not take a position on this bill, and that ended up, um, I feel like, being a miscalculation because uh, there's a lot, a lot of things you calculate when you decide to testify in opposition to a bill. I do not testify very often in opposition to bills, and so um, we were very nervous about it, but we kind of kept watch on it and kept track of it, and we felt like this year we just had to take a position on it. Um, so that's that does kind of explain you know, why we weren't here last year. It would seem your testimony acknowledges that there are those maybe with a lifetime, you know, black eye that are on the list that should have cause to be removed. Uh, but what you're saying that it sounds like is there's a lot that should be on the list that never get on the list. Absolutely. Actually, I review usually at least once a week. Once a week, a legislator asks me to look at a case from a constituent in his district, and I am regularly reviewing cases of really horrific um, abuse that people, that your constituents are coming to you, and they're, they're beside themselves because these children are being hurt. And we haven't reached a substantiation. People don't understand the standard is preponderance of the evidence. Um, there's a lot more, from my perspective, um, there's all the can, all the stories that have been told today. I, I could, um, the story, I've heard horror stories from camera review boards of camera review boards doing absolutely horrific things and turning up and overturning substantiations on cases of child sexual abuse that would make your hair curl. Um, so, you know, all of this does make me very, very nervous. Um, but I feel like um, there's perhaps some compromise here. And, um, you know, I just I do have a tremendous amount of respect for Representative <coughs> and Representative Conway to know that there's, there's good intentions here and there's good work to be done here. Um, we just got to be so careful. And to review, I, I vaguely remember this from last year, but d does the standard of preponderance of evidence change with this proposed legislation? No. It's still there, okay. Yeah. I thought, Representative Melinger, you had cited some language that would give a tweak to that last year. Uh, well, um, for the most minor offenses, like the mother fell asleep and the baby ran out in the, in the, uh, in the street, and the deputy sheriffs took him into custody. And those kinds of matters, uh, it would seem to be that uh, when I say lessen the legal standards, I think in that particular kind of uh, issue, common sense should prevail. Uh, and so that, that's what I want right. to Any other questions of the witness? Representative Newt. Mr. Chair. Um, Emily, thank you very much. You, you brought up a point that I'm wondering. Um, you tell me uh, if it's actually in this bill or if it would be a good idea. When you talk about um, even those who are uh, wanting to come off for ver various reasons and about them being prohibited from working in with populations that are vulnerable, should that is that part of this language or should it be even those coming off? Um, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. You mentioned about people who are on this registry and um, being prohibited from working in industries um, that deal with the vulnerable populations. I'm wondering, is even if they're, they're coming off of this list, would, they, would it still be a good idea to prohibit them from those occupations? <coughs> well, it's my understanding that we never can be really sure. Um, well, I think that people who are coming off, so I'm not sure, I'm sorry. I think that if you're, so basically if you're put on the registry, um, you can't get a job in one of those industries. And so if those folks come off of the registry, I mean, I do think there's nothing that can be done to prohibit them from doing that. Um, and I suppose that, that I could, we can, we can, Live with, it, with, live with that um, because I do think there are probably cases of people, Representative Ellinger likes to give me a hard time and say the, the sleep deprived lobbyist with two young children, you know, falls asleep on the couch and, um, you know, we, there probably are cases where people who are not a, are not a threat have, been, have had a substantiation and we want to recognize that that probably does exist and that, 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 that maybe those folks do not remain a threat. I mean, the reality of the matter is there's threats, there's threats everywhere and we can't control all of them and I feel like if we eliminated the tier two we would probably be getting to a good compromise you know this is so hard to do this work the right way thank you the questions the witness seeing none thank you for your testimony you. any others wish to testify in opposition to the bill any wishing to testify for informational purposes uh, 
uh, Representative Conway or Ellinger, do you have any brief closing comments? Uh, we're not trying in any way to release back into society those people who have committed serious offenses. An example would be to use your daughter in any way in a sexual manner. I don't care how much you rehabilitate yourself. You're not coming before our revised panel. Same thing is true if a person beats a child an inch of their life and then now is asking for remorse because they're rehabilitated. You know it comes. The way the bill is written right now, and we would, of course, give consideration as the last witness, there are different kinds of punishments. I have a 13, I have a 15 year old high school daughter who's very mildly, very strong, and she tells me, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, and there is one slap, and that's the only time that man. Uh, well, should we take that child away? Should we penalize that man for life if he can show that he goes through these new programs and so on? And so, and so on. And we're leaving it up to the division to make the definitions. They get the ultimate call for the code of state regulation. Believe me. They don't want to be accused of being like, oh, I'm collecting or promoting child abuse. They want just the opposite. When you ask some of them, they'll tell you privately. But a lot of people on that list that shouldn't be there. That's called policy making, threading the needle. I urge you to do that. Okay. Representative Connell? No, thanks. All right. Thank you very much. This concludes the hearing for House Bill 1849. We're now going to move on to House Bill 1898, Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Representative Kurt Barr, District 102, St. Charles County, and I am presenting House Bill 1898. Uh, just behind me to the left, I have uh, several witnesses who are going to testify in favor of the legislation. They have all the answers to all your questions that you will still distinctly ask. So I'm going to give a quick history of what this bill does, and then uh, with your indulgence, to defer to my witnesses who can do a better job answering questions. So the reason for uh, House Bill 1898, it comes from the Infant Mortality Premature Task Force. Uh, this task force was created two years ago from our, our chair's bill, House Bill 555, um, a couple years ago, creating a, this, this, this task force. Uh, myself and Representative May are the two still sitting members who are members of, the, of this task force. And the, the idea was looking at ways that we could reform or update uh, state policy to be able to help prevent infant mortality as well as premature death. Uh, this bill is one of those um, policy recommendations. It uh, basically requires the department to uh, create some uh, guidelines for a, 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 or a statewide prenatal care collaborative. And I'll defer to my witnesses to explain what exactly that does and how that will help um, with uh, infant mortality. Uh, there are some questions I'd like to go ahead and All right. Uh, any questions of the witness or a sponsor? We'd like to move on to witnesses. So, seeing that, uh, let's bring up your first witness in favor of the bill. Do you want to talk? Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see who's sitting back here. Good evening, committee and chair. I appreciate you hearing this bill. I am here to testify in favor of this bill. This is a um, long-fought 
thing over the summer. And I think the committee on premature infant mortality did an awesome job. You know, not including myself, but all the members <laughs> that worked on this did an awesome job. And I think this bill is going to go a long way in improving infant mortality. So I do want to record in favor of the bill. All right. Any questions of the witness and representative? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. Any others wish to testify in favor of the bill? Good afternoon, Chair McGrissom, board members of the committee, and um, thank you, Representative May, for those kind words about the task force. My name is Susan Pendig, and I am here speaking on behalf of the March of Dimes today in the capacity as their chairperson for state um, for state advocacy and government affairs, um, but I am also a named member of the task force on prematurity and infant mortality, and uh, worked for the past two years um, on the recommendations that you have in front of you. In fact, I chaired the policy committee, which is the committee that generated. Um, the idea for the recommendation that is now before you regarding regionalized perinatal care. And I'd like to thank my colleague on the task force, Representative Barr, for, um, for uh, supporting this bill and for filing this bill. Um, to give you a little bit of background, the perinatal regionalization concept was first articulated in 1976 um, in a March of Dimes report toward improving the outcomes of pregnancy. And that report recommended three levels of care for newborns, ranging from level one care, which is your basic newborn nursery care that most of us are familiar with, to level three care, which is the highest, which at that time was the highest level of care for babies that were born either prematurely or needed medical or surgical interventions. Um, in 1976, Toward improving the outcomes of perinatal care, uh, recommended referral of higher risk patients to higher level centers of care that would result in organizing our resources and organizing assessments and um, risk identification in pregnant women and in newborns so that they could essentially access the most appropriate level of care for their condition. Um, in the ensuing time, we have approximately 30 states that now practice within a regionalized system of care. And what we have learned in that time since 1976 is that a regionalized perinatal system of care does work in improving infant mortality and uh, reducing poor infant outcomes. Um, for example, Research has told us that the availability of neonatal intensive care unit care has improved outcomes in our highest risk infants, um, both those who were born prematurely or with serious um, medical or surgical conditions. And these improvements have been directly attributed to those early recommendations. I should also note that since 1976, March of Dimes reports um, toward improving the outcomes of pregnancy uh, they have issued, um, I believe, two additional reports, um, again, refining those recommendations as well as looking at recommendations around maternal care as well as care that is provided women be to women before and between pregnancies to assure that they remain healthy. Um, likewise, we have learned um, not only in sending the newborn to the appropriate level of care, but actually having the mother receive the appropriate level of care during pregnancy also impacts those infant outcomes. Um, when women have high-risk conditions and they are required to be stabilized, um, intrauterine transfer, or actually transferring the mother to care while she is still pregnant, to meet her level of risk or having consultation um, with an appropriate level of care does indeed improve outcomes for both the mother and baby. In addition to the medical and surgical care that's provided for the mother and baby in a regionalized system, there is also opportunity to 
provide education to health care providers throughout the state so that appropriate risk assessment is done, so that new technologies are available and uh, new learnings are disseminated to providers throughout the states in collaboration with the perinatal uh, centers and to provide for real-time consultation. So if a, a woman is delivering or if a baby is in a nursery in a hospital that does not provide the level of care that that mother and newborn need, they would have real-time consultation availability with the perinatal center in a standardized fashion so that um, help could be available both on the ground and um, while the physicians and the healthcare providers work together to determine the best course of action for that mother and baby. Um, also, I would like to state, um, I know that you all have received a copy of the task force report, and I think it's also very important to underscore in the task force report, the task force was very committed to assuring that all providers who touch the lives of women, their children, and their families, collaborate in providing the highest, most coordinated levels of care to meet the needs of moms and their babies in Missouri in order to achieve better outcomes for our citizens. So thank you for this opportunity to testify this, morning, this afternoon. Thank you. Questions for witness? Seeing none, oh, I represent you. To inquire, please. Proceed. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question goes to, and I'm just sort of looking at the fiscal note now, but who pays for um, the, the care of the, of the child and the mother? Um, that varies from state to state, and uh, that is something that as we um, further define and respond to some of the questions we will need to look at. Um, I believe we have people here testifying who actually have experience with regionalization in other states who could probably answer that question better than I. I really only just care about the state of Missouri. Um, and uh, so, yes, I'd like to get an answer to that question. And if the costs are charged back to insurance companies, you know, I just like to know about that. And for those who are not insured and currently in Missouri don't have access to insurance, I just want to find out where the, who, who is responsible. And if those people and their children, their babies, will indeed get treatment. Um, well, in the state of Missouri, based on, um, because we do, pregnant women are eligible for Medicaid, um, right now those costs are paid by the payers that are providing for prenatal care and pediatric care. So um, this really isn't looking at changing those payment structures as much as it is looking at um, risk stratification and assuring that women and their newborns receive the appropriate level of care because they are already receiving care that's being paid for. Right. Okay. That's what I want. Okay. To Thank you. The questions to the witness. Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Others wish to testify in favor of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman and Committee, for allowing me to speak on uh, this issue related to women and infants. It's very important. My name is Judy Wilson Griffin. I'm a perinatal clinical nurse specialist at SSM, but I'm here representing Missouri Section A1. I am the section chair. And A1 has almost 400 nurses who are current members, and we support perinatal regionalization because of the aspect of coordinated care, the education it provides, and ongoing communication. We believe that it is a way to continue sharing best practice, the newest evidence, and that we also believe that it affects all providers and that at all levels, whether you're inpatient, you're in the community, and that you also have to get the community involved, and that you have to have community engagement. And by doing that, you can impact infant mortality. Uh, I also served on the committee 
and know that by engaging everybody at every level, we can make an impact on immortality. Thank you. So my quick question. The information that is reported to the department, and Representative Barr, you might be the one to answer this, is that confidential? Or is there identifying information that goes to the department? Yeah. What's the intent there? The patient information? Yes, because it, it, um, if I'm reading it correctly, that the information is reported to, there's um, high risk pregnancy and child first, that that information would be um, turned over to the department. It's aggregate, it's de identified. Okay, so. that's all I want to know. Thank you. Other questions, the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Others wish to testify in favor of the bill. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify in favor and support of this bill. My name is Susan Staub, and I'm the Executive Director of the Maternal and Pediatric Services for SSM St. Louis. So the uh, two high-risk centers for SSM is SSM St. Mary's Health Center and SSM Cardinal Glennon Children's Medical Center, high-risk OB, high-risk neonatal. I basically just have one thing I'd like to leave with you. Um, so this is going to be short and sweet, and you're probably all going to think that. But, um, from experience, I was the administrator of the Southern Illinois Perinatal Program for 12 years. And the experience that, our, uh, that we had in Illinois in reducing infant mortality, infant morbidity, and also maternal mortality was based on the coordination of the services of these different levels of care that were offered. And one of the services uh, is education, perinatal education educating the providers at level one hospitals, level two hospitals, level three hospitals. And that was probably the most beneficial to improving health care for moms and babies. Thank you. Any questions of the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Others wish to testify in favor of the bill. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, Thank you very much for giving myself and, and my team uh, this opportunity to show support for House Bill 1898. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Gilgross, and I wanted to give a physician's perspective. I am a high-risk OBGYN. I'm a professor of OB uh, at St. Louis University School of Medicine, and I'm the division director for high-risk OB. We take care of the high-risk moms and the babies that they are carrying. Um, in addition, I'm also the uh, perinatal coordinator and the perinatal outreach, outreach coordinator for SSM and the medical director for uh, St. Mary's Hospital, one of the high-risk centers that Ms. Staub just uh, mentioned. Um, our division uh, of high-risk OB within our department of OBGYN fully supports the regionalization of perinatal care. Every member of, of our division has extensive experience in this with regards to the work that we have done uh, in the Southern Illinois Network. Uh, we've all basically dedicated our, our careers to caring for moms and the babies that they're carrying, whether it be a routine pregnancy or the highest risk pregnancy requiring the highest acuity level of care. Um, regionalization. Really what it does is it allows for an invaluable communication and collaboration with our colleagues from across uh, the state and across the region. It allows us to share information and allows us to share ideas. As academic physicians, uh, we cherish the opportunities to meet with, to teach, to conduct morbidity and mortality reports, uh, to do other specific uh, invited lectureships or other sorts of shared educational uh, experiences. And from this collaboration, from these relationships, what occurs is a comfort in working with each other, a comfort in helping each other out. And along the lines, you start to see improved outcomes in the health of uh, moms uh, and babies. And, and that's really what it's all about, uh, because if we can get our patients and their babies off to a good start from the very beginning, 
we know that we can set them up for the rest of their lives, and that's obviously going to help them uh, from a health setting as well as a potential cost care setting uh, in, in the future. So uh, we are all about doing anything we can to enhance the health of our communities, our moms, their babies, so we fully support this uh, important endeavor. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. A few questions of the witness. Doctor, um, just for referring back to some of the findings of the uh, Task Force on Prematurity and Infant Mortality, I'm trying to recollect, are we doing, is Missouri ranked like 38th or somewhere around that range on infant mortality? So um, we are in the uh, mid 30s with regards to our infant and, mat and maternal mortality rates. And uh, we always want to make sure that we are not forgetting the, uh, the mom. Uh, one of the most striking, uh, striking, you know, numbers that was presented when you guys presented the Children's Services Commission was that the immediate uh, NICU costs for premature births can be around 75,000 range and then go up to, you know, set, uh, seven figures over the longer course. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, you've got about 8,000, give or take, children a year being affected by premature birth in Missouri. Well, our premature birth rate is about 12 percent okay so we're probably a little bit higher than the national average uh, just a point or two higher but uh, it's about 12 percent of all births so i'm not sure what the exact number is but it's pretty substantial the point being when you multiply 75,000 upwards and seven figures times you know that many thousands of children per year that's billions of dollars per year being rolled into cost for the hospital systems on the state, so Certainly. it's an important issue. Certainly. Uh, thanks for your testimony. Any other question to question one is Dr. Neal? Uh, yes, uh, inquiry, please proceed. Can you uh, give me an example from what would we, one would expect in a uh, rural hospital? What, uh, what kind of standards would come down? Uh, one of the first ones that comes to mind would be a limitation of gestational age that that hospital um, could provide care for the newborn. So, uh, depending on the hospital resources, size, etc., there are certain levels of gestational age that that uh, hospital could care for. A small hospital in a rural setting probably could care for a 36 week and upward baby. So, if a woman presents to that hospital, say at 25 or 26 weeks with a complication, then that would trigger a consultation and a potential transfer. Uh, it would trigger communication between the two centers and then a collective decision whether or not that mom would <coughs> need to be transferred. So is that, is it, is this, would, would this be a mandate type thing that if we have somebody or is this going to be still at the discretion of the obstetrician? Well, I believe it, I believe it would be a mandate. Okay. Very, thank you. Yes. Representative Monson. Fire. Doctor, when these children are born premature, um, like, who pays for it? Because you know, a lot of times the insurance companies consider it a pre-existing condition, so they're you know, the parents pick up coverage for the baby once it's born. I have had several, couple of constituents come back and say it triggers a pre-existing. So who, who covers these costs? Are we gone anywhere in regard to that? So we help these parents out um, with the cost involved. Yeah, well, excellent question. I think that um, the initial care of the newborn and the initial hospitalization and all the care that's given before they actually go home is 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 covered. Okay, good. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Any other choice to testify in favor of the bill? All right. Any wish to testify in opposition to the bill? Any wish to testify for informational purposes? Seeing none, you have any closing comments, Representative? You have this uh, uh, document in front of you. It had it's basically a, a two-page from the Infantile Task Force uh, report. It uh, basically gives talking points of this program, its value, and benefits, and uh, um, a little bit of history of the. Of the task force so it's a, a quick read it's to help understand exactly what this bill is designed to do that's close thank you thank you this concludes the hearing for house bill 1898 we'll now move on to the hearing for house bill 1848 representative Hamlin, whenever you're ready
members of the committee, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, hear 1848. Uh, this is a first time bill, first time that we, we filed this in Missouri, and actually um, it is uh, based on some legislation that uh, a few other states have already uh, uh, passed into law. Let me go a little very specifically what this does and what it applies to. And um, again, um, I have witnesses that will be able to answer your questions in detail. Uh, first of all, what this is, is applying to uh, this provision uh, for 1848 only applies to an entity if the primary purpose of that entity or organization is to provide pregnancy-related services. And uh, you can imagine that is pretty broad uh, definition, and that's the way we'd like to keep it. Uh, let me go through some of these uh, specifics, though, if, if, if an entity would fall under this category. Um, and the first one being that if there are um, pregnancy-related services being provided, um, including um, or offers to provide a you know, prenatal son uh, sonography, uh, pregnancy tests, or pregnancy options, that there must be, if there's medical procedures are offered or uh, done, that there must be a corresponding medical um, uh, personnel that would provide those. And again, the bill specifies exactly who those uh, practitioners would be. And again, um, if these medical services or treatment is provided, that they also um, a written notice of whether uh, these uh, written notice also of uh, uh, other uh, services that the entity either provides or does not provide, um, specifically talking about adoption services, abortion services, or even um, uh, availability of contraception. And one of the other important parts of this bill is it prohibits this entity, if they fall under this category, uh, to collect health information. Um, from someone there uh, without the written authorization. Um, again, I think this sounds like a, a, a common sense uh, provision. And uh, that basically covers what this uh, bill would require. And again, um, what we're trying, what I'm trying to do here is to make this a uniform uh, a system across the state in terms of women who are looking for uh, pregnancy related services that they are aware of what the entity would be uh, providing, uh, who would be doing the medical treatment, um, if that is something that is offered, and also um, what kind of referrals would be done. Um, and the reason I mention referrals is that we want to make sure that if there is a, a reason for a, a woman in her pregnancy to be referred to a, for an additional reproductive health care um, that these referrals are actually made um, and actually uh, so not risking on the pregnant woman's health or safety. Okay. That's right. basically uh, the overview of 18 Corrigate. Questions of the sponsor? Thank you, Representative, for bringing this forward. I mean, I this is a great piece of legislation. It is pretty straightforward. It seems to me that it would um, just make sure that women are getting accurate inf medical information that kind of clears up that concern we've had in the past. And um, I, I can't imagine anybody would have opposition to this, would you? Um, I sincerely hope shoes of a, uh, a pregnant woman that's seeking some type of, of care of, of service and I believe all of us expect this when we you know uh, go to our own medical providers we, we want to walk in uh, regardless if they're providing you know physical therapy or anything we want to know what it is that they offer is it something that I can uh, that we can actually access who's providing that uh, medical uh, service and then also referrals Right, because we've heard testimony frequently in this committee that um, some of these other entities do provide medically accurate information and are important patients. So it's, again, certainly there wouldn't be any opposition because it just clarifies that craft. And if they're doing that already, there would be no opposition to it, right? Correct, and, uh, and I believe um, there'd be a witness testifying, you know, in terms of you know uh, 
we're not assuming that all entities are not doing these things. Right. If we protect those entities to give them more validation that they are indeed providing medically accurate information and providing good services. So it, it actually is a protection for all entities is the way I'm looking at it. Of course, and it also, I mean, I think the bottom line is not to, to be focused much on the entity, but, you know, um, the protection of, of a woman who's about to be pregnant. Right. Thank yeah. you. Representative, um, looking at the summary, you know, it makes you immediately think of crisis pregnancy centers. So it, does your bill mean that they would have to employ a doctor, or nurse practitioner, or a PA, or a nurse, or a nurse midwife? Only, if you read the rest of the bill, only if they are uh, providing a medical service that and would that be done by one of those. Does that include sonograms? Uh, yes, that's why you, you yeah. see here in terms of registered nurse, a registered nurse, a nurse midwife. I mean, these have all been determined by the medical community as being able to provide that. Very good. Any other questions to the sponsor? Yeah, Representative Monticello, you're on the roll. Uh, representative, and talking about sonograms, when I was pregnant with my son a couple of years ago, <laughs> uh, they they weren't doing vaginal ultrasounds. Now, subsequently, they're do, now doing vaginal ultrasounds. So it would be even more important that someone um, administering an ultrasound be a trained medical person to do that correctly. I mean, because that, that could impact a pregnancy, right? Perhaps oh, lead to oh, definitely. But I think the loss of pregnancy. Definitely, and I think if you think of it in terms of any type of sonogram that you would receive for any type of purpose, I mean, I broke my leg in November, I want to make sure that who is giving me this service is someone that is actually qualified to do it. I mean, exactly. again, this, this goes beyond who the entity is, it goes beyond, you know, someone who's pregnant. I think we just want to make sure that if you are offering this medical uh, treatment that you are doing it by a medically certified um, well, as a pregnant mom, I want to make sure that that information is accurate so I can protect my pregnancy in every means possible. So I want to know if there are problems. So if someone's reading that inaccurately, that could possibly put my life at risk or my unborn child because we, we want to protect the safety of life, correct? Well, and, and the mother. Well, I think we just want to protect the medical care. I mean, we, we assume that this is happening in all of our, you know, the rest of our realm in terms of when we, when we expect, you know, um, accurate medical services. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of the sponsor, Representative Brat. To inquire. Uh, so, if you're just doing a regular sonogram, uh, I mean, I guess, uh, what are some adverse effects uh, if it was a non, uh, non, I guess, uh, certified person administering that? Well, number one, you want somebody that's actually trained on that equipment to be able to read it. Um, I think you would expect that if you were to receive any type of other sonogram, and even if you're not pregnant, I mean, you want somebody to actually make sure that they are qualified, they're trained on this, not for me to do a, a sonogram on you and then not knowing what I am reading or, you know, the, the actually the medical experience of reading that sonogram. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready to have, uh, we haven't found out what we're having, but I mean, we've done the, you know, the sonograms and stuff. I mean, it's just basically hearing the heartbeat and, you know, making sure stuff's there. But I don't think at these pregnancy resource centers, they're, they're you know, taking the dimensions of the cranium and, and all this type of stuff. They're just showing that you have a heartbeat and stuff like that. Well, uh, you know, kind of like taking a kid's temperature. I mean, well, do you might, need a doctor might, to do that? It might sound simple, but for someone who actually, I mean, like just like we heard the previous bill in terms of people, we were talking about prenatal care. You just, I mean, a pregnant woman deserves um, accurate prenatal care. So and if, you're not, I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm saying if so you're depending on that sonogram, if you're you're in you're in a, a, a entity and they're offering this service to you, you're going to assume as a patient that there's someone there that's actually accurately reading it. If there is a problem, you want to be referred and say, hey, wait a minute, this may not be the best test here for you. You need to go and find additional um, you know, treatment. So you need somebody who understands how to read that because of uh, the dependency of a woman going into an entity. You want to be able to trust not just that test, but to trust the technician. Well, I think the purpose of a, a pregnancy resource center, most women go in there to find out if they are in there. They're doing these just preliminary type sonograms to hear if there's a heartbeat or things like that. They're not 
like I said, they're not going there for their medical care and finding out the, the dimensions of, of the stage of the pregnancy. They're going there just to, to find out if they're pregnant and see if they are. Well, that could be one interpretation, but I think um, pregnant women who are um, have utilized some of these entities. Now, again, we're not. Do you have? Do you we're have saying, of, of that? Well, we're not saying that all are bad. See, that's, that's the problem here. We're not okay. saying that they're all doing anything inaccurate. But the ones that do provide it, uh, just remember that a pregnant woman is dependent on that uh, technician or depending on that test to to be accurate or to give them the prenatal care that they're looking for at that moment and get. Sometimes it is just a confirmation of pregnancy, uh, but there's others when you are receiving that confirmation, um, there could be, uh, you know, problems. And you want to be able to, and if you look in the bill, it also talks about not just reading it accurately, but it's a referral. Having somebody just hearing for a heartbeat, I mean, what problems are you going to, what are they going to be able to solve? Well, you're going to be able, you should be able to refer to say, wait a minute, this, this does not look, or we cannot give you the care that you need at this moment. We need to refer you to, you know, um, so another medical. Do you care. require in this bill a disclaimer that about what kind of services they provide? Correct. Is that, Correct. So I guess why mandate a, a medical, someone medically, they could just, you know, put an amendment on there saying that hey, you know, you know, none of this is, you know, uh, done by a medical physician. We we encourage you to go also see. You know, uh, doctors advise or no OBGYNs. Well, that's that's why that that provision is actually in the bill too. But again, you know, many women are you know again, if you were to receive a sonogram on your leg, you're going to assume that the person administering that has some kind of medical background to be able to read that accurately. And that's all that we're ensuring that if this the sonogram is actually being read by someone who is actually trained on that equipment, um, as what's listed here in the, in the bill. Um, when my wife was pregnant with our third child, um, we decided to get one of those 40 ultrasounds. Um, we were taken into uh, the room at a couch, big screen TV. Um, but they were not certified necessarily to give medical advice. Would that ban this type of procedure? Well, or this type of, it doesn't uh, ban <coughs> the procedure. It just says that you need to be a, one of these medical entities that are you know, trained on that equipment. But that would raise the cost. I mean, we weren't going to seek medical advice. We were going because we just wanted to take a look at the pictures of, uh, you know, the life that was that, that was growing inside the womb. And uh, it, by placing these type of mandates, you might prohibit people that want that because you're going to raise the cost. Well, I think you need to remember the previous bill that we just heard that was talking about um, postnatal care. This is the time in a pregnant woman's life when they need that to be read accurately. And again, there are people that, you know, if you are, but, but we were, that's not your intention. That wasn't well, our intention. We just wanted, we simply wanted to look at the life that was growing. Um, and we weren't seeking medical advice. Um, we, we just simply wanted to observe. Uh, well, again, that needs to be. Uh, and this it, bill, it, in terms of it needs to be notified, that's exactly what this entity is offering. That So a pregnant woman is not under the assumption that they, their a test is being read by someone medical. I mean, we, we were able to do this for less than $150. And, you know, to go get an ultrasound, you know, would probably range from three to $400. Um, I understand representative. And I want to make sure that that, I would want that to be available in the future. Representative Monson. Representative Kane to comment on that. Uh, this is a difficult conversation for me to have. I suffered a miscarriage a few years ago and I went to my doctor to see that life. And when I got there, um, I didn't hear that heartbeat that life that I wanted to hear. I was at my OB, and actually a high-risk OB. He was able to tell me that we need to monitor this, but it looks as if we're pretty sure we have a pretty good accuracy when this pregnancy occurred, so we're pretty sure it's happening. I needed to be monitored. They knew I was going to miscarriage, miscarry. They needed to monitor me for my health. 
they needed to have that conversation with me that I could possibly, here's what you need to look for. You could bleed out. You could die. So it, it, isn't, it's, it isn't as easy to say that you want to just go and you want to look at it. So I, I wanted that. It didn't happen. So it's important that the person reading that, they have accurate information and that they know how to read those things. So I think that's what they're, and I don't want to speak for the representative, but I think that that's what she's getting to. And my intention was one thing, but with the information that I was given, I needed additional medical information. Now, had I gone to one of the, um, an interview that, that such as you did, perhaps maybe they would say, you know, there's some concerns here, you probably need to go see your OB, but we want to make sure that that, that is happening in case that it isn't happening. or um, you know, they might have sent me home and said I wasn't pregnant, you know, at the time I did. You know what I'm saying? So there are additional reasons that we need to make sure that that information is accurate. Um, and it was a difficult time, as you can imagine. It was extremely difficult. It was important to me that I was getting accurate, good medical information for me to cope with the loss of the baby that I very much wanted. No, I mean, I understand that. We, we lost three children in I know the second trimester, and I know it's, it's very difficult, but there sometimes you're not seeking medical advice maybe but had i gone and i wasn't seeking medical advice i just wanted to see that and they didn't provide me with that medical advice it could have had an impact on my health not only could it have had an impact on my health at that time it could have precluded me from having future pregnancies so i think that's why it's important that when we're it, it is a medical i mean it's a it's giving it, it it needs to be made, we need to make sure that when we're giving proper medical information, um, and again, the, uh, my OB didn't do that ultrasound. He had an ultrasound tech there, but she was trained in that procedure, and she shared some of it, but she brought the doctor in, my OBGYN, for additional information, but she was trained in being very clear what it was she was seeing, not just listening for a heartbeat or finding a heartbeat, because it was critical at that time. Again, not for my, not only for my immediate health, but for, uh, you know, and, and I was high risk. I was, you know, it was a few years ago, so I was um, older that we knew my pregnancy was going to be somewhat high risk, but it also could have precluded me from having future pregnancies had that gone wrong. So I think that, for me, that's why it's so important that we're making sure that uh, this information, this, these procedures are being done accurately, and there's good information. People actually know what they're seeing on the other side of that that test. Thank you. The questions of the sponsor. Um, you know, Representative, this this discussion that just happened between Representative Montez and Koenig, it does beg the question of the distinction, the delineation between. Uh, a woman that would have a pregnancy go to an OB and, and get a sonogram. Obviously, there, there's staffed people there. There's going to be a PA or a physician or a nurse practitioner or a technician or maybe all the above. But in the case of a crisis pregnancy center or pregnancy resource center, uh, why would there be an insistence on anybody more than a trained technician that knows to how to use that equipment beyond staff there. I mean, what's the point of having an onerous requirement, what seems onerous, for additional medical personnel to be staffing any crisis pregnancy or pregnancy resource center? Well, I think it goes back to, again, I'm going to refer to the, the bill that we just heard in terms of talking about perinatal care. Um, I'm also the grandmother of, of a granddaughter who was diagnosed in utero of, of some very serious problems. Um, and I understand, being pregnant myself, that you know there's different reasons why you want to see your sonogram, different reasons why you want to see your ultrasound. But if you are someone and you are depending on that sonogram to, to, to be accurate, to tell you what you need to know at that moment of your pregnancy, uh, you're dependent on it. You're dependent on it. And you need to know that if this is what the medical uh, test that's being offered at a facility, you need to know exactly what the limitations are, um, who is reading it, and will they be will there be a referral if they if there is something that is a miss? Again, it could be a miss from you know two weeks on. Uh, and that's what this is making sure that someone who is and I'm sure there's a cost factor. 
But we also heard about perinatal cost factors. This is something that can be prevented um, early on, and I believe it's just as valuable for uh, a pregnant woman who's depending on that, depending on that entity to provide them with that kind of knowledge or care. So if a woman goes to a crisis pregnancy or a pregnancy resource center thinking she may be pregnant or she knows she is and a sonogram is performed and there's clearly a baby there, it's not a seahorse or anything else, um, what's the point of questioning whether she's going to get accurate with accurate medical information to confirm that is an unborn baby? Well, Representative, that sonogram does more than tell you that you're pregnant. That first sonogram is valuable and actually um, tells you what type of pregnancy you have. Right. And that pregnant woman deserves that information, deserves the fact that she is depending on that test to be her first indication of anything. So it are needs you, to are be you, are you read saying accurately. It could perhaps show a placenta preview or it could show a, a, an abnormality that would, would warrant further medical attention. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Any other questions of the sponsor? Seeing none, thank you very much. Are there any wishing to testify in favor of the bill? members of the committee. My name is Ryan Summerford and I'm the statewide manager of government affairs for Planned Parenthood Advocates in Missouri. And we want to thank Representative Newman for bringing forth this bill and we're here to go on record in support of um, House Bill 1848. Um, we believe that this is um, really a bill that women deserve to know. Um, women deserve to know about their pregnancy and if they are, um, you know, many times uh, we've heard in this committee and in committees this session, and, and um, I would probably gauge to bet um, for previous years that a lot of these pregnancy resource centers already have doctors and nurses on staff. But most do not, according to a report, uh, a recent report. And we feel that um, for some, some of these pregnancy resource centers do specifically try to mimic the look of a healthcare center. So um, somebody right off the street who doesn't know that it's a religious-based organization and not a healthcare center, but they see a sign that says free pregnancy tests or free ultrasound, they go into these standalone clinics. They're not in a church. They're in a standalone facility that is meant to look like a healthcare facility. And many people who do go in don't realize that they're going into a religious-based organization. And um, they don't reveal the religious-based um, agenda until the woman has already received her pregnancy test and um, or ultrasound. Um, this bill, I'd like to point out, does not eliminate pregnancy resource centers or crisis pregnancy centers, but it does hold it to a standard that women have the right to know. Women of all faiths and beliefs deserve basic, um, accurate, and unbiased information uh, about <clears throat> health care. Um, House Bill 1848 would ensure that women are clearly informed about the limitations of pregnancy resource centers before she decides to take them off uh, on their free offers. And with that, um, I'm open for any questions. Questions of the witness, Representative Barr. Sure. You referenced a report about pregnancy resource centers. Do you have the name of that report or a copy of it? Sure. Um, I can actually email that to the chairman. Um, it was an executive report done by um, Pro Choice Missouri NARAL, Pamela Summoners, who was here from St. Louis but actually had to leave early. I believe was going to provide the committee with the report, but I could be um, happy to forward that on to the chairman Thank and to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add to that real quickly, you know, we have many that are doing this already on their own. It's not all of them. Many uh, crisis pregnancy centers are already doing what's in this bill, which which we love. And of course, you know, if you were to send someone that you referred someone who was pregnant, you would you would feel assured that they were getting the treatment that they were expecting to get. 
Representative Brett. So, so I guess do you do you think people have don't have the right to, to set up something just to to kind of uh, lead someone to, to making a, a an informed decision? Uh, do you think that these crisis centers are not doing that? Is that kind of that's kind of what I took from they're not doing it in I don't want to say that all crisis pregnancy centers are doing or not doing something because I think that it's evident and there's been proof <coughs> in recent studies that uh, there's variations of them of what they do and do not do. I will um, point out that in this bill um, it would just need to be if they don't have a doctor on staff or it's not being the ultrasound or pregnancy test is not being done by a medical professional. It doesn't prohibit them from stopping, you know, to, to not offer that service. It just um, allows them to provide in writing to the to the patient that they're serving that that these services are being provided um, by non medical professionals. Further questions or comments? Thank you for your Thank testimony. You. Um, I will let you know that uh, I am dropping off my testimony and I do have a couple of individuals who were here today earlier but actually had to leave that I'm leaving their testimony. Um, the first is Jessica Lambrecht who is from St. Louis and she's written her testimony and also Dr. Colleen McNichols who can testify to some um, specific times that she has encountered of patients coming into pregnancy resource centers seeking um, an ultrasound and their health were put, was put at risk because medical professionals were not there to diagnose the pregnancies of an atopic pregnancy or an abnormality that put the woman's health at risk. And do they, do they have written documentation? Yes. To us? yes. All right, we'll include that in the written record. Thank you. Any others wish to testify in favor of the bill? Seeing that, any wish to testify in opposition to the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Samuel Lee with Campaign Life Missouri on record in opposition to uh, House Bill 1848. Take uh, a I time out here. Just say, Representative Newman, if you'd like to join us back up here, you sure. need our <laughs> witnesses. Not sure where I'm supposed to. So it'd be better if you question them up here than back there. So. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a bit of a cough, but it's not contagious. So if I cough, I have a little coughing table while I'm testifying. Please don't uh, worry about getting sick. Uh, we, first of all, thank this committee for having. Uh, considered all of the legislation that is uh, dealt with uh, pro-life agencies and uh, abortion uh, in the past and uh, we're especially thankful for all the support that you've shown to Missouri's 18 pregnancy resource centers, uh, 18, uh, 18 maternity homes and 57 pregnancy resource centers, especially by the uh, reauthorization of the tax credits last year. That has been especially helpful uh, to these agencies and as uh, an earlier hearing showed uh, the numbers of abortions are continuing to decline. So we're very thankful for the support that you've shown uh, in the past. However, uh, this bill, uh, we're opposed because we find that it uh, interferes, would interfere with the fine work of these agencies. Uh, this bill's unnecessary and would be a uh, very broad governmental overreach and would be unconstitutional. Uh, and let me deal with that aspect of it first. Uh, uh, this uh, proposal is similar to some other ordinances. Uh, that have been passed in other jurisdictions. Uh, I'm going to mention one in particular and a court case from January of this year, uh, Evergreen Association versus City of New York. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals had to deal with a New York ordinance, New York City ordinance passed in 2011, uh, which among other things required that pregnancy centers had to disclose whether or not they provide uh, or provide referrals for abortion, emergency contraception, which is for prenatal care. Prenatal care. That ordinance required that uh, these centers uh, have to disclose this at the entrances and the waiting rooms, on advertisements, and during telephone conversations. So as you can see, it's very similar to this proposal here. Um, and what the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said on, on a case that was on appeal, uh, said is that this particular provision of the ordinance was unconstitutional because it overly burdened the speech of these agencies, that is their First Amendment uh, right to free speech. And uh, they found that 
expressions of public issues has always rested on the highest rung on the hierarchy of First Amendment values, and that for the government to mandate speech that a speaker would not otherwise make, make necessarily alters the content of that speech. And in this case, the court found that by requiring that this information be provided in a certain manner and in a certain time runs afoul of the First Amendment uh, and struck down that portion of uh, the New York ordinance. So I think that this bill, if we're going to come past the law in its current state, uh, uh, at least that portion of the bill would, would uh, suffer a similar fate if it were to be challenged. Uh, secondly, our concern of the bill is um, uh, is that it's very overbroad uh, and very overbroad government intrusion. Uh, and I appreciated the sponsor mentioning that the uh, phrase uh, pregnancy-related services in this bill is intended to be broad because we, we looked at the types of entities that could be affected by this law. And certainly we've mentioned the 18 maternity homes and the 57 pregnancy resource centers here in Missouri. Uh, but also, uh, if that term pregnancy-related services is taken in its broadest sense, as the sponsor says it should be, then this would affect, of course, your various right to life organizations, uh, including your church-based organizations. Uh, this would affect uh, groups like the Respect Life Apostolate, which is the Archdiocese of St. Louis uh, entity, which provides pregnancy-related services and uh, provides uh, through its entity and it's through its subsidiary entities, which are the various parish pro-life groups, uh, pregnancy option counseling. Uh, so if they did not happen to have a physician nurse practitioner, physician assistant, registered nurse, or nurse midwife uh, on site, then either you could take the sponsor's uh, characterization of the bill as that they could not operate, or as I read the bill, they would have to post signage uh, that says whether or not this entity uh, uh, provides contraceptive drugs or devices and on-site consultation with uh, practitioners, et cetera, et cetera, or provides abortion services. So just imagine for a second that you have the, uh, uh, in my home parish, All Souls and Oberlin, uh, the parish pro-life group is meeting. Uh, they would re be required at every entrance, and meeting in the church basement, at every entrance to the church, uh, they would have to make sure that signs were posted uh, uh, that says that uh, we don't uh, provide contraceptives and we don't provide abortion services, uh, and, that there, and then also then at that meeting hall, that type of signage would have to be uh, provided. Um, your various agencies that provide natural family planning, uh, they would, of course, have to post similar signs. But there's really a whole host of other types of organizations uh, and entities that provide pregnancy-related services. Uh, and I'm sure I'm going to uh, exclude a few, but those entities that offer Lamaze classes or other pregnancy assistance, uh, adoption agencies, uh, Representative Koenig, you talked about the uh, the group that you went to, the organization you went to, that provides the ultrasound pictures. Sometimes they're called keepsake or heirloom uh, ultrasound. Uh, they would have to have signage uh, uh, saying whether they do or do not refer for abortions, or do or do not perform abortions, or whether they do or do not have uh, a physician uh, present, uh, or whether they provide contraceptives. In fact, if this uh, ultrasound, heirloom ultrasound, keepsake ultrasound entity, was inside a mall, which sometimes they are, uh, every entrance to the mall would have to have signage as well. Um, your genetic counselor's offices, um, your LLHA League uh, uh, entities that provide lactation consultation during pregnancy. Uh, we had earlier today the March of Dimes, which of course uh, provides pregnancy-related services and pregnancy options counseling uh, to their clients, uh, and they make home visits. So, of course, they would have to paste on the uh, doors of the home of the client that they're visiting this type of signage and, uh, and would certainly have to have the signs posted inside the home as they're providing counseling on how to make sure. It doesn't drink and smoke too much and things like that. Um, your Vashon High School in the city of St. Louis, which has a pregnant and parenting high school uh, program, uh, they, of course, would have to have the signage. I can go on and on and on, uh, and, uh, you, you know, certainly uh, I imagine someone could say that this bill could be amended and be changed, um, and maybe it will be, maybe it won't be, I don't know, uh, but certainly the, the broad implications of this bill 
should give anyone pause uh, if we're to proceed further. Uh, the penalty for any of these entities for failing to comply with this could be up to $10,000 fines, uh, injunctive relief. Um, and I don't think the government should be stepping in and telling people to deliver the government's message or any message in a way that runs afoul of the First Amendment or requiring entities which are providing, in many cases, free of charge, these services to pregnant women in need to have these signs posted and to require all sorts of other uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, types of, of, of things to, um, to comply with. Uh, I would say, though, that Representative Koenig, if, you were to, if this law were to pass, if you were to go back to that uh, ultrasound, keep saying ultrasound place, you would no longer have to pay $150. Because under the terms of the bill, uh, page 3, uh, lines 65 through 67, notwithstanding any other provision of, of the law to the contra contrary, these entities have provided no charge to the patron, one copy of any health information of the patron. So you would be able to get your ultrasound free of charge. Uh, how that business would continue to operate and function, I don't know, but you'd get it for free. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Monticello was surprised. Let's inquire. Um, as I'm reading this, is, it says provide pregnancy related services. I don't perceive services as counseling. We're talking to so did your parish. I, I did because he does he does go to that, but and it does talk it does talk about pregnancy options and counseling, but to his point. Does your parish offer prenatal sonography, pregnancy tests? No, they don't. Uh, but pregnancy options counseling, certainly. Uh, these are options that will be provided to a woman when she's pregnant. Uh, that could be as a matter of whether she continues the pregnancy or not, or whether she keeps the baby or places the child for adoption. But it, it could be a whole range of things. It could be uh, nutrition advice. It could be uh, advice on uh, taking care of yourself like the March of Dimes would provide. Uh, these are pretty broad terms and undefined terms in the bill. Would you be okay if, we, if the, uh, the counseling piece was taken out and we're just giving disclosure as to what medical services would be provided? I would not be okay with something that runs afoul of the First Amendment. Well, I guess HIPAA laws run afoul of the First Amendment? Not that I'm aware of, no. Why not? Because they're just disclosing and they're giving you notification. I mean, it's just... Representative, I'm happy to, you know, to give you a copy of the court's decision. I'll give you the excerpts if you want me to, uh, or I can send you a link to that and you can read it yourself. But I've, I've read why uh, the court has said that uh, the government cannot, in these circumstances, in a law that's very similar to this, cannot uh, tell an agency how and when it can deliver this Well, well then how can medical entities or agencies be required to provide HIPAA? HIPAA is more for the protection of the health care information of, of the patient, so I'm not quite sure what this goes to the health care. This actually goes to the actual health care of the patient on their health. So I, I, I don't see I, I don't see the difference here. You we're telling an entity, the government told an entity you have to provide this information because you're I, if I didn't misunderstand you, your testimony was unconstitutional because by First Amendment rights the government cannot tell an entity how they're gonna provide information. And HIPAA does indeed tell ent medical entities they have to provide this information and how they have to what do the it. What the Second Court of Appeals said is that the, the disclosures, that is the required information, will change the way, and I'm reading from the, the decision, you can disagree with it if you want to, but it is the Second Circuit Court of Appeals looking at the law and looking at the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The disclosures will change the way in which a pregnancy services center, if it so chooses, discuss the issues of prenatal care, emergency contraception, and abortion. The centers must be free to formulate their own address. Because it mandates discussion of controversial uh, political topics, the services differs from other types of laws uh, that are considered brief, bland, and non-pejorative disclosures. Uh, I'm taking a quote out of context, but again, I'm happy for you or for all the members uh, to take a look at this. Uh, you know, I'm not aware that there's been a challenge to HIPAA, which is requiring that information be disclosed or that information not be disclosed uh, has been challenged. But that's different than the government saying you shall or you shall not provide this information 
at the government's time, at the government's choosing, in the way that the government tells you to do it. And I don't think the government should be telling a church, which is offering pregnancy-related services and counseling to pregnant women to come in, I don't require have, to be put aside. I don't have a problem with the. I don't have a problem with the church not being required to indicate that they're providing counseling. If the priest wants, or there's an organization there that wants to talk to women about her option, I don't have an issue with that. What I have an issue with is that some entities promote themselves as health care centers and they're giving medical and health information. That's far different than talking about, you know, we think this might be the best course of action. They are giving medical advice and medical information. As a patient, I should have a right to know that those people aren't certified. They're not trained. Because if you hold yourself up, as a medical profession, you're giving, I mean, and I talk to women. They've gone in and they thought they're getting information from medical personnel. I don't know how that is an impersonating medical personnel, to be quite honest with you. I mean, they may fall under some other laws that maybe we can look into. But I have a right to know who's ever giving that information. If it's medical information, then they're not medical personnel. And some of these entities hold themselves up as giving medical information when they're not indeed medical personnel. Would you would you I, I would, I would, would you go I, to a heart would you go to someone who's promoting themselves as a heart surgeon, they're not really a heart surgeon, would you not have issue with that if they're giving you heart uh, information about your heart health and they're telling you you need to have heart surgery and, and they're indeed not a medical doctor and, and trained and qualified to give you that information? Why is that different than me being able to get information about my my reproductive health or the health of my baby? And that person may be giving you information that's putting my child at risk, my unborn child at risk. I'm guessing your question. You, would you be okay with that? Would you be okay with someone giving it to you advice that you need to go in and doing and doing medical procedures on your heart when they're not trained and qualified to do that? Would you be okay with that? Representative. Would you be okay with that? I, may I answer? It's a yes or no. Would you uh, be okay with that? So no, if I can't answer it the way that I want to answer it, then I can't answer it. It's not a yes or no question. Oh, it certainly is. I mean, I think most of us would not, most of us would not have any difficulty telling us we would not want somebody to do heart surgery on us that wasn't a medical personnel. I, I no for. Mr. Chairman, I would point out that also that. Uh, midwives in the state, uh, many if not most of them who are not nurse midwives would be affected by this bill. Uh, so a midwife who uh, had a birthing center uh, or who went for a home visit uh, to uh, provide uh, pregnancy related counseling uh, and pregnancy related services would be required of course to have this signage uh, with them at all times. Uh, in fact, even as they're delivering the baby in the home, we have to make sure that in the room where the baby is being born, that there's signage that the woman, according to the terms of this, uh, has to um, be able to see in a, in a clear manner signage that uh, this entity does not perform abortions or does perform abortions or contraception or, or whatever that is. And I think that's, again, unwarranted uh, governmental intrusion. Because again, most of these midwives are not nurse midwives. Uh, they're certified by other agencies. Representative. I just want to make one quick comment about, you know, we're kind of going all over the map in terms of what if and what could happen. But I think if you look at actually page two, line 23, the entire bill goes back to this initial sentence. And everything in the, in the bill is on, on on this specific provision only. And that is, it says that the primary purpose of the entity, again, the primary purpose, is to provide pregnancy-related services and the entity advertises or solicits offers to provide uh, prenatal tests, pregnancy tests, or pregnancy options. That's exactly what the entire bill deals with. It doesn't deal with uh, birthing. It doesn't deal with anything. You have this whole bill has to be specifically to this section. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay. Uh, Representative Brown. To inquire. I guess this is mindful. I mean, people are, women are going here for, for just while they're in a crisis wondering what to do, they're not 
they're not going for to have the baby there, correct? I mean, this isn't like she's trying to stay with the heart surgery. I mean, you would go to a doctor because you're having heart surgery. These are just women that, that, first off, don't even know what's going on, and they're just they're seeking someone. And the church is stepping up and rendering, uh, giving their information on on their viewpoint of, of the world, which is a religious viewpoint. Uh, am I? Am I no, I mean, I, I, correct. That that would be one type of entity, but I hope like, my point is not lost. That there's a whole range of entities that's going to be uh, affected that, by that. Can be affected. That their primary purpose. Uh, is to provide pregnancy-related services, and many of them may not provide sonography or pregnancy testing, but do provide pregnancy options counseling. And these are to be affected by this bill. And I, you know, words do matter. And we can talk about, well, I mean this or I mean that, but any court that's going to be construing this is going to be looking at the bare words of, of what it says. Uh, and I don't think the government should be telling whether it's a, a religious organization uh, that maybe all they're doing is their primary purpose, that entity's primary purpose, is to make sure that pregnant women get maternity clothing and that they, babies when they're born would have uh, uh, infant clothing, a, new, a newborn infant clothing, and provide vouchers for uh, car seats and for cribs and things like that. Uh, that entity, and that would be the primary purpose of that entity, they would be affected by this bill as well. Now, uh, I, I don't think the government should be telling them they have to put up signs and say this or don't say that. Uh, or tell them how they should be delivering that information, but they're providing this free of charge based on their religious beliefs. Uh, that's not right. Now, do women, uh, are there cases where women actually just go to the Pregnancy Resource Center and that's the only place they ever go through their the entire pregnancy? I mean, is this you know, I probably not. I mean, I would certainly hope not, and I, I know these agencies do make referrals. I mean, they will say, who is your health care provider? Oh, you don't have a physician. You don't have a, a nurse practitioner. You don't have a midwife. Okay, you need to see somebody because prenatal care is very, very important. So, of course, they would all make those referrals. Uh, most of them would not have those medical personnel on the site. And why would they? They're offering these services free of charge. Um, I don't know of any OBGYN who's working these sites who's offering their services free of charge. Somebody's paying for it. Um, and Either they, under one interpretation that the sponsor made, they would be prohibited from operating, or the interpretation I give to this bill is, if you don't have those one of those medical personnel on site all the time, then you have to have all these signs, you have to have all these disclosures, and you have to do all these things, or else we're going to fine you $10,000 and, and get injunctive relief, and that's wrong. Thank you. Representative Monasamo. Um, what I might, might point out is they're really not free of charge. We pay for it because they're getting state dollars and back there was an increase in the state budget this year. We can't fully fund the foundation formula, but we're getting an increase to these centers who are not um, willing to uh, let people know what service. So I would suggest to you, Mr. Lee, if you don't want government intrusion, if you don't want government involvement, perhaps you should um, not take government dollars. Thank you. Uh, to to comment and have a dialogue with Mr. Lee, if I might. Thank you. I, I just think it's important, as you characterize the church needing to put up signs or um, the malls needing to put up signs, if we go back to where the sponsor of this legislation uh, pointed us to section 2, on page 2, lines 23 through 26, the provisions of the section apply to an entity if its primary purpose is to provide pregnancy related services and the entity advertises or solicits so and the entity advertises or solicits patrons with offers to provide sonography pregnancy tests or pregnancy options counseling so you know I, even your church um, that does provide counseling to some of its uh, church members or people in the community I don't believe that's your church's primary purpose. If it's something if that's not true, I'm I'm certainly gonna allow you to make that statement. But uh, that may be something and a place people go for some counseling. But I don't think that those are the primary purposes of of these entities. So again, I think we, you know, as you said, words matter, and these words matter too. We need to, you know, understand the underlying purpose of this bill is to make sure that when people get medical input and medical advice it's coming from people who are medically trained 
and I think we all know that. And, and if there are some areas where you're concerned about the language and think it does something different, then I, I you know, I don't want to speak for the for the bill sponsor, but I imagine that she's certainly open to, um, you know, to, to to hearing what you have to say. But let's not mischaracterize uh, what this bill is really intended to do. You know, it's interesting, uh, Representative uh, Black's Law Dictionary defines entity to mean a separate thing. All right. And so it could be a corporation, a for-profit or not-for-profit corporation. Uh, it could be an unincorporated association of individuals. Okay. Uh, it can actually even be a person. Uh, okay. So uh, an entity, you can have the Catholic Church, which you can say, well, that's the Vatican. And you have entities, which would be the Archdiocese of St. Louis. It could be All Souls Church. Uh, another it entity certainly could be, the, could be all of those it, things, well, Mr. Lee, but it isn't because they don't fit under the rest of the definition, which says that entity, which doesn't say that person, but if that person's primary purpose is to provide pregnancy-related uh, services, and that person advertises or solicits patrons with offers to provide pre uh, prenatal sonography, pregnancy tests, or pregnancy options counseling, then perhaps that person does fall under this. But I don't think the Vatican falls under this, and I don't think the other kinds of buildings or places or other nouns that you want to, uh, that Black's Law Dictionary provides under the term entity, um, again, fit under this definition in, in, uh, in Section 2 of this bill. Now, that said, if you have a better word than entity that we think uh, characterizes correctly the information that the sponsor is trying to put forward in this bill, I would bet that, that, uh, that she would be willing to hear you out on it. Thank you. Questions of the witness? Uh, Sam, you know, I read a bit of a free for all that well in New York, Stacey would comment on this, but in lines 23 through 26, does that language describe both a pregnancy resource center or a Planned Parenthood facility, or would there be? Uh, you know, I, I think it could. Uh, yes, I definitely think it could, uh, among other entities. So the difference is that the seed is by appearance that, you know, a Planned Parenthood facility would probably be more fully staffed with medical personnel or <coughs> possibly a crisis pregnancy center. It may not be as fully staffed, but this would create an obligation for the crisis pregnancy or pregnancy resource center to add additional staffing would that be a crisis? If, if the if the sponsor's interpretation is correct that they would have to have at all times a physician a nurse practitioner a physician assistant a registered nurse or nurse midwife uh, on site at all times whenever they are open to the public uh, and that could be a very big cost uh, certainly, that means that they could maybe no longer could provide services for free because they'd have to pay the salaries unless they can get volunteers, which maybe they could, maybe they can't. I don't know. You said 40 something such centers. There, there are actually uh, 57 pregnancy resource centers uh, of varying sizes, from little places to, to, to very large, and 18 maternity homes. I think a bill might put some out of business. Oh, I think that if they had to comply with this, or else face uh, $10,000 fines and be enjoined from operating, uh, yes, I think they could. I'd point out also that uh, if these entities are located inside another building, lines uh, 47 through 48 uh, require this notice at all entrances to the premises at which the entity provides the services described in subdivision one of this subsection. So again, you have your ultrasound, your keepsake ultrasound in the kiosk in the mall, or your uh, uh, room inside your church that's providing the matern maternity clothes and baby clothes, uh, the entrances of those premises have to have signage. I'm just reading the bare language of the bill. Okay. Do you have a comment, Representative? Uh, yes, I just wanted to clarify your original question. In terms of if uh, an entity, again, the primary purpose, and then also offers these <coughs> type of services, they only have to employ one or more, and it doesn't. Nowhere in the bill does it say all of them, and nowhere in the bill does it say at all times. It's just whenever one, if any of these medical services or medical treatment is provided. 
Off, okay, thank you. Offhand, do you know of the student something pregnancy resource centers in the state? Would all of them employ a medical professional at least one? Or would some just be going with the tech? I, I would say there'd be fewer than more that would have somebody. First of all, not all of them have ultrasound. <coughs> all of them would administer uh, pregnancy or essentially would administer pregnancy tests. Uh, but these would be you know, off the shelf types of pregnancy tests. Uh, so they, they would be covered. But no, they, they do not. Uh, most of them would not have on site when they're providing medical services or treatment, would they have one of these people there? So it would affect the bulk of them. The larger ones do, would normally have uh, a nurse on staff. Very good. Any further questions, Louis? Seeing uh, reference on my side. If, if some of them, they're perfect pregnancy tests, let's go to that. Not all of them offer sonograms. What is the purpose of offering those pregnancy tests when a woman, and it's over the counter, that a woman could do easily on her own, getting an over the counter test? You know, I can't tell you the psychology of why someone that would wait until. I'm talking point. about the center. What's, what's their I, motivation? I'm not trying to answer you. Okay. I don't understand, I don't know the psychology why a woman would necessarily wait to go to one of these centers to have a pregnancy test. Maybe they feel I'm talking about confident. the woman, I'm talking about, I think you misunderstood my question. Okay. I'm not talking about why a woman would do that. I'm talking about why would the pregnancy centers be offering, and sorry, I probably noted it um, not very well. Why Why are these centers offering pregnancy tests? Well, to help the woman determine whether she's pregnant or not, and it help her but, the, but it's so easily for a woman to do on her own. So these pregnancy centers could save a lot of money. Yeah. They could they could save a lot of money, could they not, if they weren't buying these pregnancy tests? Because a woman could easily do that on her own. Is it is it not to bring women in so that they can be um, so that they are able to direct that woman in the direction that that entity would like them to go? These entities provide services free of charge to pregnant women. I think that should be applauded. I think this committee and this legislature. I, I agree with you, and I think a lot of them do provide good services. I, I that they, they do that they provide milk. I agree with that. I'm with you 100 percent on that. The problem the, the the problem I have is when they're providing inaccurate medical information. We keep going back to that, and I don't understand your reluctance to try it. We try try to fix this last year. All I wanted to do was make sure that they were providing medically accurate information. That's all I wanted to do. I'm not trying to close every pregnancy resource center down. I think most, probably most of them provide good services for women. We would be in agreement on that. But we want to make sure that the bad actors aren't out there providing bad medical information to women. And it concerns me that you want to protect the bad actors. Thank you. See, I want to follow up on that. I guess the question would be, what is documentation that there are bad actors? And I could direct that back to the representative as well. But to answer her question about why would a woman, when she get a 299 test like we used to, you know, why would she go into a crisis pregnancy center or pregnancy resource center? It would seem an obvious answer is that if there is a confirmation that she is pregnant, she could be provided with information as to possible alternatives to abortion. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. Sure. And, and obviously that's where a lot of our policy and even budget making goes. And I know some of the some of the larger centers have more sophisticated tests on hand that you cannot buy over the counter. I think some of the smaller ones. Just get them bulk, you can get them cheaper, or maybe even donated so the woman doesn't have to pay anything out of pocket. So I have a question for Herb Zamanaso. What would be an example of medically inaccurate information that a CPC would provide? My understanding that at times they have been um, given misinformation as to where they are in their pregnancy. Uh, another issue that I haven't uh, that I have been brought to my attention that one woman <coughs> did, uh, to seek some assistance, and she was told until and again this is a facility that um, receives state dollars was told that and, um, if she were willing to accept Jesus Christ in her life they would help her, but if they weren't, she wasn't willing to do that. They showed her the door. I have a problem. I think if we really care about the same sweet life, we're trying to protect women. Why would we turn a woman away in her moment of crisis? Was she perceived to be a crisis or need? Um, and again, if you're going to take state dollars, I have a problem with that. And I would hope most of this committee would have a problem with that. 
Good answer. Thank you. Any other questions of the witness? Seeing none, we're finally done with you. Thank you. You're running out. <laughs> All right, further out. I wish you to testify in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, Susan Klein representing Missouri Right to Life. Here to go on record in opposition to House Bill 1848. Uh, House Bill 1848 is really just a way, uh, it is really kind of a state's version of getting the discussion of abortion into the pregnancy resource centers, <coughs> into uh, where people of faith or uh, organizations that are faith-based uh, are not going to do abortions. Uh, and they're not there to have the discussions regarding abortion. Uh, ambulances are not being called to these pregnancy resource centers who are doing great work to help women in, in crisis pregnancies. They're not being called to these uh, pregnancy resource centers because these PRCs are giving um, pregnancy tests. Uh, whereas ambulances are being called by, by the dozens to Planned Parenthood. So the pregnancy resource centers are doing a great job, and uh, as, as Mr. Lee stated, uh, this would put an undue burden on the First Amendment rights of these PRCs, and we oppose this bill. Very good. Any questions of the witness? Representative Rumley, you get the EPA straightened out last week. I tried. <laughs> I was wondering about did Planned Parenthood give an alternative like uh, some of the pregnancy resource centers thing? I mean, do they get both sides really well? Before an abortion, the, the, the Planned Parenthood is required by our state law to give uh, information about the alternatives to abortion. Okay. I was just wondering about that. Also, I had a. I've been. I've worked with children. 35 years in ministry and different things. And um, I received a phone call one year <coughs> by a lady that knew that I was involved in helping people. And I can't describe to this crowd that everybody the screams I heard on the phone because she just went to Planned Parenthood and had an abortion. I didn't even know the girl hardly at all. And when she called, the screams I heard on the phone, I'll never forget. And she told me I wasn't told how it really did. And so we could give stories on both sides of this issue. And I just want you to know that, you know, it. I, I agree with a lot of things that we, we were the last witness. And I, I just want to protect life because I really think that's what we ought to be doing. And I agree that we ought to protect women. And I think that both sides do do that. And that just, just that story, I will, I will never forget. We've heard examples on the other side of my wife about that example, how that affected me, and how I will never forget it. And she said she was not informed. I she wish she would have been. Thank you, Representative. We hear stories, too. Heard the questions the witness representative wants to Do you Do you believe it's appropriate that Planned Parenthood should have to give um, choices, alternative choices to abortion? Planned Parenthood is, is in the business of abortion. abortion you, that was in my abortion. question. I didn't ask you what they were in the business for, Ms. Klein. I asked you, do you believe it is appropriate that they should um, provide patients or women alternatives to abortion you think that's appropriate policy and appropriate statute that they should have to give that give women that other information alternatives to abortion i believe if you're going to take the life of an i'm asking you a direct question abortion. and you know you're not going to win this do you believe I, it should be an easy answer for you i'm assume i'm going to assume here correct me if i'm wrong since you're wanting to dance I'm assuming that you believe it's appropriate that Planned Parenthood should have to give that information, let women know that there are other options to them and available to them besides having an abortion. I'm assuming, you think, I'm assuming you think that's right. So I'm wondering then why the crisis pregnancy centers, why there's opposition to them giving women all of their options. Because we can make the argument, well, Planned Parenthood, you know, I've heard the argument they, um, you're, the, the crisis, that they should have to have the same 
requirements for Planned Parenthood, simply that they're giving women all of their choices. Crisis pregnancy centers are not taking the life of innocent. Thank you, ma'am. So I, I can't help but ask a follow-up question to that. Uh, is there anything in statutes that do require Planned Parenthood facilities to provide information or alternatives? They do. Okay. I was I was inquiring of the illegal contraband in the many room here, the ice cream <laughs> first floor. <laughs> All right. No, it's, it's all good. We gotta get it done so everybody's got time to get some if they want. Representative Brad. So in regards to medically accurate information, uh, does uh, Planned Parenthood call uh, that the child in the womb a living being a, a life or are they called something different or an alternative uh, you know uh, I guess name to my knowledge they do not call that uh, baby in the womb a baby okay. well because I, I was looking up and, and I typed in uh, how to determine whether something is living or not and they these are you know medically what they use whether it's uh, it's made of cells or obtains and uses energy uh, and, and has things to reproduce itself, uh, let's see, responds to its environment and, and adapts to its environment, uh, has a heartbeat. Uh, so these things could be at, at what, I mean, what stage of pregnancy? I mean, my goodness, at, at conception, correct? I mean, because they're multiplying cells and so. I would almost say that, that Planned Parenthood is giving inaccurate information by not calling uh, that living organism, that baby, what it is. A, a, it's, a, it's a living being within a womb, correct? So if we're going to talk about medically accurate information, I would almost think that Planned Parenthood needs to practice what you're preaching you know, when, in their testimony because they're giving medically inaccurate information in regards to a living being. Am I correct? I, I would agree with you, Representative. Okay. And and the fact that they are actually ending life with state dollars, they're not they're not helping to determine what to do with that life. Right. They're they're actually performing an abortion with taxpayer dollars, federal taxpayer dollars. Federal taxpayer dollars. Yeah. I'm not saying state. I'm saying with taxpayer dollars in general. Yeah. But they come from this state. So thank you. For the questions of the witness. Seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. Any others wish to testify in favor of the bill? Chairman Committee, for the record, Carrie Messwood, Missouri Family Network. We'd like to go on record in opposition to the bill. Uh, I'm not certain who all the bill covers. Uh, it's clearly aimed at pregnancy care centers, and quite honestly, with the continuing decline in pregnancy numbers in the state of Missouri and the universal credit uh, being given to the pregnancy care centers around the state is one of the primary reasons for that steady decline. Uh, I don't know why we would be so hypercritical of their work. Uh, these are not-for-profit service providers. They're not making money. They're spending their hard-earned money to help make these things work. There is reimbursement for some people that work in some of these facilities, but the facilities are registered nonprofit agencies. Uh, they they work hard to maintain standards of best practices uh, when they use uh, sonograms or whatever other services they provide. Uh, they do it under best practice standards. Uh, those who can have doctors and nurses uh, on staff. Those who can't work with in conjunction and consultation with doctors and nurses who are on their boards and help oversee their work and, and are there uh, as resources for them. Uh, the main issue here is uh, pricey care centers are not health care providers. <coughs> they don't claim to be health care providers. They're wellness care and resource centers, and that's it. Uh, all this discussion about medically accurate uh, information or bad in terms I've heard here, bad and harmful, medically inaccurate information, uh, you're a legislative committee, you will make your decisions, but if I was sitting in your shoes, I'd be asking the question, where are all those medical lobby groups that stand around in these hallways and work this building and come before these legislative committees, why are they not here supporting this bill out of any concern whatsoever? about what our pregnancy care centers are doing to service people in need in the state of Missouri. And where are they when it comes to this question of, are these pregnancy care centers really guilty 
of misusing information to, to try to or waddle people into some philosophy of their own. No, they're there to help people in need. And that's it. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Questions for witness. Representative Monticello. Uh, do you have has it been made available to you? I know NARAL has a study on they've done a study on the crisis pre the pregnancy resource centers. Or do, you, do you not have a copy of that? Because I'll be happy to get you a copy. I do not have a copy. I don't think I'm on their immediate contact list. I, we can probably share some information because we there is documentation that just exactly those things are going. I would and, and again, we we just want most of them are doing the right thing. That's what we want is make sure they are doing the right thing, and we want to make sure that they were taking care of the bad actors out there. I don't think there's any of us that would suggest that they're all doing evil and doing bad. I, and I don't have a problem if people want to go to religious entities to get advice and solace. I just want to make sure accurate information is given. And the point about Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood, they give women their, their choice of their options, what options are available to them. They don't go in there and sit them down and try to force them to have an abortion. So let's be clear about that. Well, with all due respect, so I've never heard someone come out of a Planned Parenthood clinic saying that they were told that their baby was a living baby either. So, yeah, it's, this is a, we have to admit, this is a philosophical debate. This is not an academic debate that we're having today. And so what do they tell you they're told that they're, that they're called? So they have blobs of tissue. Oh, I don't, believe, of I don't believe that for a second. Do you know, I've been in Planned Parenthood. In fact, I've been to Planned Parenthood just to when I was in college, just because that's where I could afford my, my my medical care. Didn't go in for abortion services. Didn't go in for anything else. They provided me medical care because when I was at college, because I can't could get back to my OB when I was home because I had a medical condition that was causing me some problems. That was the most affordable choice. I mean, we forget in this whole dialogue they provide a whole range of services and they do provide good medical. Um, health care for women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question of the witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do not any others wish to testify in favor of the bill? Opposition, I'm sorry, it's a long day. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I was not planning to speak, but I got a little different angle. I was an advocate on the mobile unit for Thrive Pregnancy Resource Center. And uh, oh, ma'am, can we get your name and who Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Gina Allen and I am an entity of Gina Allen. So you're representing yourself. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, at times there has been only me as a counselor and the driver on the mobile unit that was parked across the street from Planned Parenthood. Um, these women, we, we are trained. The training for this is extensive, year long, took all my free time. Um, these women are coming in there for a crisis. crisis. They have sometimes taken their own home pregnancy test two or three times, and they want to come in. Um, our brochures and all the information that we give them are from Thrive's doctor approved <coughs> information. It, it is, it is uh, <coughs> approved information and accurate according to the physician. Um, the sonograms, they are sent off to an OBGYN and if there is an issue, they come, come back and then when the uh, sonographer makes her follow-up call with the client, then uh, they would say and recommend to go somewhere else. So, some there is opportunity for for a problem pregnancy ectopic. Um, I was or am a sidewalk counselor. I go to the sidewalk at Planned Parenthood on Fourth Park Avenue and. As people are coming through the gates, I try to give them information on alternatives to go, um, alternative places to go for their pregnancy tests, for their sonograms, for their counseling, um, for adoptions and all kinds of things. That would make me the entity advertises or solicits patrons with offers to provide prenatal sonography pre pregnancy tests and pregnancy option counseling. So 
would I have to have be a doctor to just offer this information? And um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Any questions for witness? Seeing none, thank you for testimony. Any others wishing to testify in opposition to the bill? Any wishing to testify for informational purposes? All right. Believe it or not, this concludes the hearing for House Bill 1848. All right. We uh, have one other matter of business. Um, Representative Curtis's House Bill 1813, so we're now going to shift back into executive session uh, before we close. And Representative Curtis, uh, just to bring the committee up to speed, it's my understanding that you had a sub, but it wasn't able to get distributed uh, one legislative day prior on yesterday. So we do have a, an expansive amendment uh, that we could offer in committee here that incorporates uh, the content of what would have been in the sub and the changes. Uh, but at this late hour, I'm going to suggest would it maybe not be a better course to defer till next week? Give you time to put together a sub, and I would also urge you to poll members of the committee and see if the votes are there to exec this out of committee because I, I'm not sure there are. And you know, if you've got the same bill in urban affairs, it may have a better chance to get through there. And I would hate to see the bill, you know, have a down vote if it did if it reaches the floor through urban affairs. So well, what is your uh, thoughts on that? Uh, I'll defer to your judgment. Thank you. All right. Well, why don't we, uh, in that case, uh, it's been long here, and I appreciate everybody's patience. Let's go ahead and defer until next week.